Could everybody come to order, please? Call the order of the council meeting of April 23rd, 2013. Will you rise to the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The time clock is uh, inoperative, so Mr. Falk will be keeping the time, and he will high sign you when you have 10 seconds uh, left to speak. <laughs> Madam City Clerk, could you call the roll? Could we please come to order? Madam City Clerk. Any persons wishing to address City Council on any item of today's agenda other than closed session may do so at this time. Okay, hearing no comment. Well, I see that now. Thank you for waiting, sir. Uh, Gil Matthew on uh, District 4, uh, Mayor and uh, <coughs> City Councils. <clears throat> Here again, I'd like to speak on payment of bills. Uh, many times I've asked that do you have a written policy on payment of the bills? <laughs> you see, it's time that we set some criteria of payment of the bills to validate them. And uh, many times I've asked uh, oversight of payment of the bills, no response, nothing. But yet, it's simple program. You don't need to go item by item. You simply extrapolate to give some credence or validity to payment of the bills. You don't have to wait for an audit. <clears throat> Many times, for instance, uh, two weeks ago, I stood right before you and said your hearing did not qualify because of the time of notice. I asked three times. <coughs> City clerk asked. Somebody else asked. You deferred to the city attorney. He said yes. And you proceeded, and then you had to have the hearing again because it violated the law. Now the question is, did you pay twice for advertising? Nobody knows. <clears throat> Next thing on the sound insulation, residential insulation, block grants, we need some sunshine on the money. You mute, you know, and you're supposed to be leaders. You're supposed to be city fathers. But the community is disappointed with you, particularly the three of you and my councilman. He's a good friend. But politically, we're opposite. And all of you are decent people. But the politics, you're destroying the community. And we're on a slippery slope to find out where is the money? What happened to the money? Nobody stole it. It wasn't wheeling, dealing, or stealing. It was simply mismanagement. 10 seconds. And thank you, and Mr. Fields, Sir, I respect you for staying this long. Time. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. God be with you. Mr. Springs, welcome. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Larry Springs. I'm a longtime resident in the first district. 
and I want to talk about the bills and financing that's on the agenda. <clears throat> I believe that the city, first of all, let me say this to the mayor and the city council. I really commend the mayor and the city council for actually getting the budget together and doing a fantastic job on balancing the budget. Our budget has not been balanced in several, several years, and I want to commend the mayor and the city council for doing that. But my main focus is on the bills, paying of the bills, and the, and by me saying that, I believe that we've been misusing a lot of our monies. An example would be having elections in April, September, it cost the city over $159,000 to do an election. I believe that what we should do, is I believe we should look at our city charter and go over the city charter. Our city charter was put together in 1926. That's 87 years. We've changed. In 1926, I don't even think they were phones. Now we have emails, Twitter, Facebook. So we need to look at our charter again to over to look at it again and see what we can do to make some adjustments. If we have to spend every time we do an election over $159,000, that's that's ludicrous. I think we should look at it. I think the city council should get together and come up with some way that we can talk about actually putting the city charter together or looking at it, or putting together a citizen advisory board where they can look at the city charter and make some recommendations on making some changes. And I think the changes should be primarily on this elections. I think that when we have an election, we should t go get the top person and not go 51, 50 plus 1 percent. That's, we've gotten to the point where we're just going over and over and spending a lot of money that we should not spend. I also believe that the city council members should take their information that they're receiving from staff, go over it prior to coming to a city council meeting. These meetings that we're having are meetings. They're general business meetings. They're not a meetings that we're having a debate on what should be done. These meetings are meetings that we should make a decision and keep it moving. I believe that at this particular point that we should give the city a standing Time. ovation for the things that they've done, especially the mayor and the city council, for the things that they've done this past year. I believe that if we keep moving forward, Time. the city should be, it should be moving forward and we should look at it as a, a positive city rather than a negative city. I, I can't, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I just have to say this. Sometimes we look at it and we always bring in the negative about the city and we never bring in the positive things about the city. Please, Thank residents you, of Spring. this city, this is a positive city, and you should look at it that way. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mayor. Sir. My name is Alfonso Parker, Jr. I'm a Vietnam vet, conscious objector, 6667. Uh, uh, I'm not going to talk to the numbers because the numbers don't track, but they'll catch up with themselves uh, as far as the budget being what they say it is. But according to uh, these homeless uh, uh, amounts recommended, one is, I think, 20,000 and one is 40,000, about 60,000 for Inglewood homeless. I've been speaking to the Inglewood homeless, and uh, by the way, approximately they figured about a third of homeless people are veterans. And I've been speaking to this issue for the longest about homeless, not only veterans, but it includes everybody else. Uh, Mr. Morales, who has the veterans home in his area there, about funds that uh, could be spent in Inglewood. A lot of these veterans don't need to be hung, uh, homeless or hungry. They don't have to be. The money's there. But because of young, I think Ryan, whoever ran as vice president for, uh, what's his name, on the Republican ticket, said the new young guns. You young, you young new guns don't know nothing. What you know, you know, but that's all you know. There's money in them there, facilities out there that could be used and spent in this neighborhood for veterans that are homeless. Uh, child support, 
that could be paid to women who have women of veterans who had children by these veterans. Dead veterans that have died, there's money there for you. It was allocated from the first day that veteran raised his hand and swore in as a widow. That money's there and you can't get to it because we got an executive branch military that has gone rogue. Uh, these amounts are nothing compared to what you should be uh, allocating for homeless. It's expensive to live today. And you got them 20,000 uh, for one and 40 for the other for homeless shelf, for the homeless in Inglewood. You people, they say you're nice people. I don't know, as far as I'm concerned, I couldn't sleep with myself, to be honest with you. But that's between you and your gods. I said I was a conscious objector, that's why you look at me and I still believe in my God. And you have to deal with them every day. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, Council, I'd like to point out that the clerk's office has again inaccurately documented the minutes of February 12, 2013. In the public comments, the minutes state that I called for the council to remove James Butts as council chair and mayor. I don't think the council can do that. I've never asked for that. And I'm ho actually hoping the voters do that next year. Uh, I called for the mayor to be removed as council chair. I've called the exact same thing about a dozen times. I can't see how the clerk's office can get that wrong. Um, the clerk's office also very deliberately omitted the general reason for my request to remove James Butts' chair, specifically that he has lied to the public and that that night I said that he lied to the public because he claimed that he was not personally sued for helping violate civil rights when he was Santa Monica's police chief. Uh, now, that's only another 30 words the clerk could have put in the minutes, and that's less words that they, than they use to describe other speakers' comments. Uh, the clerk in these very same minutes approved detailed descriptions of other speakers' comments, um, but she and her staff left out all the incriminating cons uh, matter about the mayor. Uh, all I really want is my comments documented just as representative of what I said as other speakers' comments. I pointed out that the reason uh, was clear that the mayor had not told the truth and if the mayor keeps not telling the truth it's pretty clear he shouldn't be council chair because no one that acts unethically should be the council chair. There was no mention in the minutes about the fact that the Yale Law Journal says that James Butts Police Department admitted to a formal policy of violating the Miranda rules and that the mayor didn't deny, say it was a mistake or a misunderstanding, he knew it happened. But that kind of stuff never makes it into the minutes. Clerk documents all sorts of other things. Willie Brown, publisher of Inglewood News Today since 1994, I don't know what that has to do with anything, commented on council members who use their position for political gain and residents are sick or tired of it. That's pretty demonstrative. But yet with me, not only do they get it wrong, but they don't give the basis for my request. This is not something that's new. It's happened all the time and I think it should stop. Mayor, Council, and to the residents of the City of Inglewood, Leroy Fisher, the First District. You know, I will speak uh, with regard to us uh, spending money, as had been uh, talked about earlier, in these elections. You know, I, there uh, have been people come here and suggest that uh, we should go back to the times when we couldn't even vote, maybe. You know, uh, it, it's uh, my opinion that. Uh, you know, people should have the majority plus one of an election. And uh, uh, that's the way it always has been here. Uh, that's what we fought and died for. And uh, that's what uh, I would uh, hold that we should continue. Uh, with regard to uh, charter changes, uh, I, I would uh, believe that there ought to be easier ways to change this charter. I have said here uh, many times before you all that uh, these salaries that you them all uh, get are much too much. I uh, believe that uh, just as uh, we had an election here and there were a couple of charter changes that uh, we just put on the ballot, that uh, we as residents should be able to change 
uh, charter things like uh, salaries, it seems to me that uh, it's, it's uh, such that uh, we who would uh, uh, want to make things fair and equitable with regard to salaries, you know, have to run through all kind of ropes to uh, get that accomplished. Uh, we can't uh, just uh, put out there that we would like to have these things done and have them done as uh, some things in this city and this charter uh, allows. So I believe that there ought to be changes in this charter and those changes ought to make it easier for people to speak as to what they want to pay for those who represent them. My name is Diane Sombrano, and I would uh, go ahead and uh, point out that theoretically we do have a charter study commission. Now, we haven't appointed anyone to that for, oh, I don't know how many years, but it's interesting that even current Price acknowledges that there was a committee that he sat on at one point that I don't think there's ever been minutes for it. So maybe if those council committees and the actual commissions had appointments that actually bothered to show up, some of these things that have just been mentioned would actually take place. Um, since I have a veterans room at the Sentinel Adobe, I know many of those young men who came back from World War II who fought for our rights that, uh, you know, the concept of election is a very important one. And anyone who claims that we can have less than 8% of a voter turnout and that all the people in the community have spoken are somewhat right because 92% of this community said none of the above. How about that? You see, I constantly hear some folks say there was a landslide. No, it wasn't. The landslide was in the people who said enough is enough, no, not me. And a lot of people have to be reminded that some people vote not for a candidate, but opposite another. And we all know who that is. But let's all get to the um, sound insulation issue. That's actually on the agenda. And uh, I would hope that whoever does the sound insulation keeps in mind the great and glorious buildings that we do have in this community that recently have been mangled beyond comprehension. Those wonderful old Spanish style homes that now have the new fan dangled windows without preserving those wonderful stained glass insets. And you know, that only costs 150 extra bucks. So we kind of took away the integrity of the architects and those very important finishing touches. I remember someone ripped out some hardwood floors that other people pay thousands of dollars to get, all in the name of modernization. Yeah. You just kind of like took the Fabergé egg and decided to spray paint it. Isn't that sad? And as far as the ten homeless seconds. issue, did you say it 10 minutes, 10 yeah. seconds? As far as the homeless issue, remember St. Aaron's? Wouldn't that have been the perfect place to house homeless folks? But no, we got a developer who wanted Time. some cash, and he contributed, so he got what he wanted. Too bad about the homeless. <clears throat> My name is Willie A.G., and I live in the beautiful city of Inglewood. And we got two of the greatest count city council people and mayor in the country. And, they, and they're taking very, very good care of this city. I'd like for the people to just pay no attention to the rhetoric that's, that's going on out there. You got good government here, the best, believe me. Uh, I want to speak in favor of uh, consent calendar number three. I think this young lady does a real good job. 
and I'm glad to see her stand. Uh, also, DR3. Now that brings a smile to my face. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, uh, what you know what's going on with Central Boulevard because once Central Boulevard is finished, uh, I tell you, going to be a lot of smiles in this city. Uh, another suggestion is this is personal opinion of mine. Uh, we'll get up to speak on cons items that's on the agenda for tonight. But every week, every week, you have people coming up here, going all over the city, everywhere, speaking about everything and nothing pertaining to the agenda. I'd like to see that stopped. I'd like to see them held to uh, the way it's supposed to be. Speak on the agenda items. That's what I try to do. Thank you. Thank you. We'll close public comment. Item one, CSA two and H one. We will allow payment of the bills. Second. Madam City Clerk. Uh, comment. Councilman Dunlap. Uh, yes, uh, with regard to the payment of the bills, uh, a member of the public spoke on payment of the bills and they referenced several things I'd like to comment on. One, they talked about uh, the budget and the budget having been balanced. Uh, we have financial policies in this city that require us to balance a budget by using uh, revenues that come into the city, ongoing revenues and ongoing expenditures. That's a truly a balanced budget. It's considered a structural deficit if that's not the case. And that's actually what's been occurring the last two years, a structural deficit, meaning that last year in 2011-2012, the budget was balanced with employee furloughs, which everybody knows about because uh, City Hall is closed every Friday. That's a sacrifice by our employees. Mm -hmm. and, and also the fact that two and a half million dollars of one-time monies to the city that came as a result of the trash contract was used to fill up a two and a half million dollar gaping hole at the end of 2011-2012. Required, a gaping hole. This year, the second half of that five million, two and a half million, which should have been placed in our reserves because we have some very serious ongoing liabilities that we've not met and we actually don't have a plan yet as to how we're going to meet those uh, uh, liabilities coming up. Uh, that two and a half million that should have been placed and kept in reserves was instead pulled out and used to fill up gaps in this year's budget, 2012-2013, completely against the city's financial policies, which state very clearly that we are not to use one-time revenues to, quote, balance a structural deficit in the budget. Just for clarity's sake, I want to bring that to your attention. And also, uh, with regard to, it was uh, referenced here also with regard to the public comments having to do with the warrant register. Uh, talking about municipal elections and runoff elections. I want to read from the city charter, a section that was created in 1982, 1982, after it was determined that in the best interest of the citizens of this community that there be runoffs as in other cities. It says, a majority of the votes cast for all candidates for each city elective office is required for election to such office. If a candidate is not elected to any city office to be fill, filled at any municipal election, a runoff election shall be held, and it mentions a certain time frame. Uh, the runoff election then will be determined by the highest vote count at that time when that election takes place. 1982, this was not an original item in the city charter, it was something that was created at the behest of the public, behest of the citizens of this community uh, to be fair and just and to make sure the best qualified people uh, had an opportunity to, to serve as their elected representatives when there were just two people running against each other. Um, and also, I want to make another comment with regard to somebody said something about a positive city, not a negative city. Actually, one cannot describe a city in either of those terms because this is actually a municipal corporation. It's a business. A municipal corporation with a complete total operating budget of $216 million and it needs to be operated as a business and we need to have uh, 
revenues and expenditures that match and this council is working on creating that balanced budget but we're not there yet as long as we're using one-time monies to fill up uh, budget holes and and employees are on furlough then this city is not op operating to full capacity and providing the kinds of services that we need to do but it doesn't serve anyone's best interest to be looking at the city through rose-colored glasses instead of facing reality and dealing with the problems uh, that are before us uh, that uh, concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank Comment, you. Mr. Mayor? Councilman Stevens. I would like to address the issue of uh, West Basin Municipal Water District. We're paying $822,066.92. Mr. City Manager, Mr. Fields, we need to repair our pumps on our wells right. so that we can discontinue this need to have to purchase water from West, West Basin. There is absolutely no reason why over the past 10 years that we have not replaced those pumps. With the recent water increase on all of our residents that was approved by the majority of this council, it seems to me that these water wells, the pumps should be operational. We should have been able to replace them by now. So i just like to place you on notice, sir, that um, I, I am expecting those pumps to be repaired hopefully with before the uh, before July because it's been it's been long enough the other issue is this Resident, um, one of the residents came before us and spoke regarding the issue of the Inglewood Today newspaper the Inglewood Today newspaper received <coughs> for an ad $5,472 <coughs> Also, Inglewood Today newspaper received an additional $2,736. Inglewood Today also received for a bid invitation $1,150. Is there anyone here who can detail just exactly what were these <coughs> event ads that are referenced here? Item number 534146 as well as 534147. <coughs> Page 4 of 6. Yes, Mayor and City Council, I'm, I can uh, inform you that the Council did take action maybe about a year ago to approve um, spending uh, funds and the um, restricted funds that are non general fund for environmental environmental related advertisement in the um, Inglewood Today newspaper. So those are the costs and if we have for Earth Day and other environment or recycling day, those are the types of advertisements that we're paying in their non general fund monies, their restricted funds. It, it simply seems, Mr. Fields, to me to pay five thousand four hundred and seventy two dollars for one ad and then pay two thousand seven hundred and thirty six dollars for another ad something seems to be askew but more important than that we also do business with a california crusader newspaper and they have an invoice here of only twenty five dollars what ad did they provide for us i believe that's what the city clerk um it could be for no okay so um, i'm not quite sure what that one is but i can tell you that the difference that you're seeing is probably the difference in the size of the ad and the um, the amount of time that an ad may run that we might get invoice for. It's a huge difference. Do we have a rate card for Inglewood today? We do. I don't have that with me here. but I think that we should have that included with our warrant register as well as just exactly what size ad are we referring to? Because as I stated, California Crusader has, an, has ran an ad for $25. Inglewood today's ad is $5,472. And then the other ad is $2,736. And then we have a bid invitation, which is $1,150. That's close to $10,000 in one week. Yeah. Well, Mayor and City Council, as you know, you get your booklets on Thursday evenings. And um, these warrant registers are in there. Myself and my staff would be happy to get you any backup information that you have prior to the meeting. So asking well, me right this point. I don't bring just, all of the backup conclude, information for just, each of the warrant items. Just to conclude with that comment, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and I know mm -hmm. that you have requested that my meeting be with you Thursday morning. Right. 
the agenda does not come out until Thursday but evening. But you don't have to have a meeting Therefore, with me to meet with oh, me. Yes, you can I do. You well, have a very that's up busy to you. schedule, sir. My door is open every no, day, 24 hours. Well, maybe open can, others, but well, not no, to me. I've never Please resisted. Time. I've never asked you not to come Mr. and meet Fields, with me. Mr. Fields, we're at time. Thank you. You know, just a brief comment. You know, I, I find it interesting um, when council members comment on a structural deficit and employee furloughs as though those are not budget balancing, balancing measures that we have to take in the interim until we grow revenues. You either grow revenues or you cut expenses. Mm -hmm. You can cut expenses temporarily or you can cut them permanently by removing employees. The city's posture has been that while we attract new revenues, a la uh, Madison Square Garden's um, purchase of the forum, waiting for that to open, the sudden activity we've had um, in Hollywood Park, receiving investment and planning to start their infrastructure um, process in January of 2014. We hope to have a meeting of expenses and revenues so that then we can start working on our long-term unfunded liabilities. But I find it fascinating that members of the council won't even permit an RFP to go out that would explore um, an outsourcing process that could yield $10, 20000000 million up front to the city to put something into the uh, reserves that are always discussed. Um, not even to understand what our opportunities are. It's, it's, it's disingenuous to just sit here and, and curse the darkness. You have to light a candle. You have to explore alternatives. It's just not enough to state the obvious as though someone's doing something wrong. You're responsible for coming up with ideas being on the council. That's our responsibility. So yes, we do have furloughs. We have to. The other choice is to lay off employees. If we came in every year and said we're cutting employees, then we're cutting your services. We're also disembodying people from city service, possibly unnecessarily, because in time we hope to have expenses to meet um, to meet cost to meet costs. So it, we just have to be responsible, be business people and do the business of the city. But you have to tell the whole story when you talk about things. Comment, yeah. Councilman Franklin. Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think it's ingenuous that um, you're looking at a warrant and not dealing with the details of the warrant. And I have a standalone meeting regularly with the city manager and the city attorney on Monday in which I do my due diligence reading over the weekend. And these issues, such as the warrant register involving Inglewood Today Weekly, has come up on more than one occasion. But I want to stress the importance that when you read the, the thumbnail sketch of description, it says city event adds plural. Not a single item, but plural. And as a consequence, uh, there is a cost impact, as particularly when many of them are in color. So there is a significant fee involved, particularly when we're trying to outreach the public. I think also what's, what's critical and important is as the, the mayor indicated about when it comes to the concerns about outsourcing, uh, I raise the level of concern, as I said it before, of institutional knowledge going out the door. Uh, I think also that it's prudent that management utilizes their employees efficiently for more efficiency by having the employees that are geared for revenue generating to be used specifically for that purpose instead of being used to oversee uh, the uh, traffic uh, guards at local public schools and then increasing that number even with law enforcement during the, the recent in incident um, <coughs> involving other tragedies on other campuses out of state is critical. And so if we're going to make these changes, or at least evaluate those changes, uh, we all need to do our homework and what is best interest for this city and what is the best interest for the safety and the quality of life for our community. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I'm City Clerk. No. 
Dunlap? No. Morales? Aye. Franklin? Aye. Mayor Butts? Aye. Consent calendar items 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. I so move. Second. Pool item 2. I'd like to pull item uh, 3. Council and, members. Uh, was uh, 6, 7, or 8 pull? 6, mm. 7, and 8? 6, mm. 7, or 8? No. Or, or and? Well, I was asking if I, any of them. No. Okay, then. Um, Poll seven. Madison City Clerk items four, five, six, and eight. Four, Actually, five. I pulled item three. No. I, I said items four, five, six, and eight. Oh, I'm sorry for the vote. Thank you. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Dunlap. Aye. Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. Item two. Approval of the minutes held February 12, 2013. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Yes, uh, Madam City Clerk, would you please uh, address the issue by the member of the public in reference to his comments? Um, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> Madam City Clerk. And council Bolt. members. I would like to ask you more specifically, is there a reason why the council members' comments are not stated in the minutes uh, regarding each item? You're saying the council comments, at, to what point could you reference that so I'll know what you're talking about? My, my understanding is, is that minutes usually consist of those individuals' comments who are on the dais, the, the body itself, the board. It hasn't been for many years. Well, your predecessor many years ago did it. Their predecessor did it. Okay. And until, I thought until recently, you did it. It seems as though that we do not have any council person's comments on any of the items, as well as also when it comes to closing comments, closing the public, you have the public listed here, but there is absolutely nothing written in reference to council comments at the end. And what is usually done in other cities is for the audience to know is that paraphrasing is oftentimes used, paraphrasing, not necessarily the exact not exact, not necessarily the exact wording of what was stated, but in fact what is called paraphrasing. What we have here is a record of history of what is said, what has been said. If you go down to the city clerk's office, you can actually pull documents from dating back to the 1950s, and it gives you a snapshot of what went on. You can pull documents from the 1960s and see a gentleman who comes to this podium right now. His name is Gil Matthew. And you can see his name listed there and what he spoke on and what was the issues at that time, accurately, accurately written. But you can also see what the council members stated also. That's identified in each item and the council's comments. You can also go back as far, you can also go into the 60s, the 70s, and see Leroy Fisher's, see Leroy Fisher's name and see the things that Leroy Fisher spoke on. My point is, is that this is a snapshot of history, and it's extremely, extremely important for all of us to remember our history because you can very well make the same mistake again. And then, of course, the price will be even a heavier price than what you paid before. So it's something for all of us to remember. One thing for all of us to remember is that these minutes are very, very important because they show the history of our city. How did we get from point A to point B? And who was accountable? Who's held accountable? Who was responsible? Who did what? What they said? And who rebuffed it? And who did not? And that is why the minutes are so important for our community and for our city. And so with that, I'll conclude, since unless, because Madam City Clerk, from what you're saying is that Mr. Chushera comment you have nothing to say about that in reference to what he stated from the podium okay I have a comment. Mike, I'll conclude with that madam clerk in the 1950s did we have DVDs 
Yes, did, I'm sorry. In the 1950s, did we have DVDs or 60s? Did we have DVDs that were available no. to the public? Thank you. Madam City Clerk, the vote. Council Member Stevens. No. Dunlap. Aye. Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. Item three. Staff report recommending approval of a one-year agreement with Paula Archer doing business as Archer Productions for professional videotaping services at a rate at 49.64 percent. I mean, f forty-nine dollars and sixty-four cents per hour. Move approval. Second. Is there a question? Yes, I've. Uh, yes. Can Councilman tell that? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> several things. One is I have a concern. <clears throat> Not about her service. Uh, I think she does a good job with regard to the equipment and so forth and her experience. I appreciate that. However, I'm concerned that we no longer ha have her here for closed session. And we have public comments here that I believe should be recorded as the meeting is recorded. And uh, sometimes we have a number of people who come to speak on closed session items and they're no longer recorded. I have a real issue with that. Um, I understand typically we have the, the opening ceremony, public comments, and we go into closed session and there's a gap before our 7 o'clock meeting. However, I think something needs to be, uh, to be worked out here with regard to maybe the hours. She's given a minimum uh, regardless of how long our meetings are. There's, uh, if we have a, a meeting that happened to take place in 15 minutes, uh, she's paid for four hours. Uh, and we have had some very short meetings, especially if it's a carryover or something. But mostly I can, I can, I'm concerned that the closed session public comments are not recorded. That's an, I have an issue with that. Um, secondly, it talks about in the agreement the uh, photographic services, but I don't see it mentioned in here in the uh, contract with regard to the rate of pay, um, which is different from the video grapher services. There's nothing in here. I would like for you to consider, Mr. Fields, uh, taking this back and looking at it, bringing it back next week, just for more clarity for the council. Because it talks here about two types of services. It talks about her uh, no. being a uh, videographer for our council meetings, which I do believe uh, the public comments earlier should be recorded as well. I think it's a disservice to the public that they're not recorded. And then secondly, She's being paid for photographic services, but yet it's not listed here anywhere. It only has her hourly rate for the videographer. It's actually listed on page three of the agreement, line 12. She's being paid $50 an hour to take photographs, like here, or wherever she takes a I can tell you that the. I can, I, I, I can tell I you that the. I will say this. I did not see that right. short line right. since it's only got uh, two words in it. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it. But let me say that we have uh, photographers, many photographers who reside in this city, some who come here, professional photographers who've been in the business for 20, 30 years. They would love to get paid $50 an hour. I don't know if there's a minimum here, is there? I don't believe there is, but I can tell you this that. Is um, there a minimum? That's what I want to know. Not no, there is believe. not. Well, there was in the last contract, that it does say here it's going to be the same as the last contract. So I would like to make sure that there is no minimum number of hours. It used to be four hours in the last contract, if memory serves me. And uh, I don't think, I don't believe she is a photographer. <coughs> I think it's someone who works with her. She strictly does the videographer here. And I'm just letting my colleagues know that uh, this amount of money, for her services here, she's very well experienced with equipment. I support that, of course. But I'm saying I think we should be working something out with regard to the hours so there not, isn't necessarily a minimum, because sometimes she's paid for a couple of hours that she's not here because the meetings are in, in really early. And of course, she's paid the same hourly rate if they're long, of course, so she's compensated for her services. But with regard to the uh, closed session comments, I think they, they should be included and they're not. And that was a decision of administration and this council, I guess. And then, uh, like I say, uh, photographers come here all the time. They'd love to get paid $50 an hour. Residents who are here in the city or business people. So I don't know why we're continuing to contract this out without l at least giving local people an opportunity. I can see why we would not do that with a videographer because of the technical nature of her job and the fact that she's been working with this equipment for a long time and it's very old and troublesome. 
So I respect your expertise with this equipment. Right but with time. regard to taking uh, photographs at our events, I do believe that we should give that right opportunity. Time, Councilwoman. I, well, he's shaking his head no. <laughs> it's three minutes. I, why do I only get three minutes? It's five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Sir. Okay. She has 30 seconds. All right. <laughs> My goodness, so quick to. Uh, Go ahead, Councilwoman. You have well, 30 please. seconds. I understand how much time I have, Mayor, but you know, you're so quick to want to shut down people talking. It's, it's rather amazing when these meetings are about the deliberative process. And uh, uh, by the way, this is a business meeting of the city mayor, and you know what? Uh, the community likes to know what's on these agendas. They like to have them discussed. So I don't think there's anybody out there in that audience except for maybe two people who want this agenda never to be discussed, no time. questions, just I, I, I with a movement, movement of approval. That's time. not the way to conduct time. Time. Uh, business uh, of a city of this you're, size. You're at time. Councilman Morales. Thank you. Um, just uh, based on the contract, I, I would like to comment that uh, usually with, with a comment of this uh, kind of uh, professional service, I've seen prices go way sky high. Here we have a woman who's been here for years, is very knowledgeable about the old equipment that we have. Uh, so if we actually had to go out, there would probably be very few people uh, that could uh, uh, operate this equipment. That in itself, uh, and the fact that her hourly rate is more than reasonable, is a solid uh, uh, contract for the city. In addition to the photography, it appears to be, at, at first glance, when you hear $50 an hour, you know, it sounds like a lot, but here you have a professional photographer, and mm -hmm. he would be the gentleman that, I don't know if you've noticed him, but at all of our uh, events here for the city, he has to uh, get there, wait around uh, to be directed as to how to document the event, collect all of the documentation, get up, wait, wait for speeches, do everything that they have to do uh, to collect the right type of pictures, develop them, put them on a CD, CD d deliver them to the rest of us. Those are things that uh, professionals do. At $50 an hour, once again, is reasonable. All of us have had experience uh, hiring <coughs> photographers, all of us. You know, I've uh, hired them for some of my events with my own uh, personal funds. They go up. Some of them you have to pay them $100, $200 to show up because they're going to be there all day and then it'll charge you. They'll give you one CD for free, and then you'll have to uh, collect the rest of them. Here we get to keep all of our pictures, correct, Mr. Falco? And just that, uh, based on the amount that's being spent, uh, and there is no minimum, if he shows up, gets two hours, that's $100. We get to keep all of the pictures. We own those pictures. Now, those are rates that are more than reasonable. To hold back on, on a contract such as this just to do it, uh, you know, that's, quite frankly, uh, you know, you, you can do that during the week. When you know this agenda is coming up, you can go into the city manager's office, discuss these things, and go right after. Right now, uh, you know, these are terms that are more than acceptable uh, to the city, and um, I'm ready to move forward there, so. Comment? Councilman, Pre Councilman Stephen. Yes, I just wanted um, just to clarify this for the audience. Um, Mr. Fields misspoke on um, page 3, line 13, it does state mm -hmm. then beneath the um, photo services for $49.64, it does state very clearly, Mr. Fields, minimum of six hours to include site visit, editing, web uploading, archiving, and storage, PowerPoint presentation, creation, and DVD hard copy, and all photographic rights. So once again, Mr. Fields, it states a minimum of six hours. You stated that there was, there, w there was no minimum, but there clearly is. That means there's a total of $300, and it can be much more than that because, of course, they have to take the photos back to their location. They need to edit. They need to upload onto the website. They need to also archive them and store them, and also if there's a PowerPoint presentation, all this takes time. So six hours could very well multiply into 12 hours at $49.64 per hour. My big, my, one of my concerns is that at the Martin Luther King Day celebration, I remember the person that was taking the photographs, and I asked him um, if I could obtain a copy of pictures that he took of me. But he said I needed to first 
obtain clearance from the mayor. Mm -hmm. Understand, I have to get clearance from the mayor in order to get copies of photographs of the Martin Luther King Day celebration. All of us on the stars are to be equal, everyone. But yet I have to obtain clearance from the mayor before he can in fact submit a request to you, I believe it is, for me to have them. To me, to me, there's another issue. Mr. Daryl Brown, is he still sitting in the, um, in the media room with, with, um, with Ms. Actor? No? In the past, he's sat there, and I know years and years ago, under a previous mayor by the name of uh, Roosevelt Dorn, there were people who would sit in the media room and would actually call the shots, camera one, camera two, far away shot, no, don't use that shot, instead of just simply using their own creative skills to simply photograph, record what actually took place. I have no problem with Miss Actor's um, skill level. I, my problem is, more so than anything, is the management of this city. Because you should have known that there was a minimum of six hours. And this is a pretty basic, simple contract here. Well, Councilmember Stevens, after I did make that statement, the city attorney did correct me, and I planned on bringing that to your attention. But, Mr. Fields, you, you are quick to Councilmember Stevens, if you, 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 don't, you, may not, you may have forgotten, it was in my, my report to you, that I was out last week. Well, you and, may and, have and, and I did not sign off on the staff report, well, so forgive me if I missed that particular detail, but I was planning on correcting it if I'd had an okay, opportunity well, to do let's so. See, let's see if I can talk as calmly as you and the mayor here, which I have very no <coughs> problem with doing. My point is, is this, is that because you also have an agenda, and because you also should read your agenda Council before. Councilmember Stevens, you are reflective. Of, you off, are a great example of someone please who doesn't do read not. their staff reports and please waits up not. until the council to do it. Well, no, I mean, he's accusing me. Yeah, but the chair needs you're to call him out of order. Are you going to do your job, Mayor? No, Mr. Mr. Fields, you're out of order. Yes, he is out of And Mr. Mayor, please, please, we should seriously place Mr. Fields on the agenda, perhaps not at the next meeting, but at the following meeting. I do a great deal of research, sir, right. online, right. and as well as also with my document right. when it's presented to me in a timely fashion. Well, the questions fashion. that you asked me, but Mr. Fields, okay. but Mr. Fields, Mr. Fields, let's could we, all keep could we our be voices. Quiet in the audience, please? Mr. Sergeant Mayor, Jones, let's keep our voices low and calm. You know how we play this little game here. It's only the issues. This is a very simple contract, a contract that is the most basic. Yet we've had so many complicated contracts. Over the, oh, no, since I've been on this dais. Ten seconds. Contracts that I have dissected very thoroughly. Water rate increases, trash hauler contracts, Inglewood today's contract. Your is time, basic. Councilman. And Councilman yet Franklin. We are paying yeah, through thank you very much, Mayor, for recognizing I'll conclude me. with that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Mr. Fields, I'm going to give you time to comment on the various comments of game, uh, but I do have to uh, precaution you that uh, we would try, we're trying to conduct business and we need to restrain ourselves as much as we can. Um, the public will speak as, uh, and they will do that when they feel it's appropriate. But you as our city manager, I, I would just encourage you just to stay focused on the issues and I'll give you my time to address those. I, I think it's, it's disrespectful for you as our city manager to have this time to be the time for prosecution and ridicule without giving you the due process of responding, whether it's rebuttal or at least clarification. And I'm going to give you that time as far as I want to expand <coughs> on. Staying with the item as agendized, I want to concentrate specifically that was of issue regarding the service rendered at the cost um, provided for us for that service. And I want to stress that Miss Actor, when she's out there in the field using her equipment, we are paying for her equipment processing and service, not like other persons that we've had where we've paid for our equipment being used and our equipment still has not been brought back to this city. 
There's a big issue to that. So I want to make sure it's clearly understood that that fee that is being required and, and talking to some of the other companies or subcontracts we reach out to, that is a price well within the norm, very much so in the norm. The dilapidated equipment we have here, I clearly reach out to uh, Mr. Actor regarding her abilities to provide to videotape, audio play, the what goes on here, and help to um, improve the sound from the podium. There's two brand new mics put in there so we can dispense any allegations that we're trying to muffle public comments, which is not the case. It's just the equipment was outdated and needed to be updated. We're also still viewing the possibility of going down to the first floor in Community Room A, which is when the funding's available, we'll do that. But we're here to identify a service being rendered and their equipment that's being utilized to help accommodate for the uses that this city needs. And now I'm through commenting, and I'll now reach out to city manager. With my time left, you may uh, comment on any of those items. You have two and a half minutes. I'll basically just state, just to add for the public, that the contract that the council is being asked to approve tonight um, has not been, the rate has not been increased in 15 years since she started work. In fact, the um, contractor has also agreed to a 10% reduction in her uh, fees since she started. So, um, as other council members have stated, I do believe that this is a very reasonable fee for the services that she's providing us for. And, and, and I'm very confident that if we would have gone out for another RFP, we would have, um, would, it would have resulted in us having to pay a lot more than what we're paying Ms. Archer. Thank you. Thank you, Brent Mayor. I'm okay, I'm going to start, I'm going to start my time. Um, first of all, as to the councilman's comment about um, the photographer told him that he could not deal with him without talking to the mayor. You know, I, I think sometimes the councilman engages in fantasy. First of all, I don't even know the person that shoots photos. I'll be honest with you. If he was sitting out in the audience, I couldn't tell you. And this is just typical of what goes on, that some outlandish statement like that is made. Of course the person would have to go through me. I don't even know the person. And let's talk about this contract, the six hour minimum. First of all, $50 an hour is cheap for any professional services, especially when the person uses their own equipment. Uh, in the old days, these council meetings would go like 12, 1 o'clock, um, but you still have to do processing afterwards. You have to make sure we have DVDs available. So $50 for an hour for that is nothing. And anyone that has retained a photographer these days knows that it's a minimum of $125, $150 an hour for a professional professional photographer. So all these are extremely reasonable rates. And as to the issue of videotaping the closed sessions, I've been here for two years, and I would say 99% of the closed sessions, there's no one here. Um, at once in a while, there's one, maybe two people. So why would we invoke a six hour minimum when we talk about our budget to tape the comments of one or two people, maybe I don't know, once every three months. It doesn't make fiscal sense to me, and I don't feel that we should pull this. It's a very reasonable contract. We've got a vendor that hasn't raised their rates in 15 years and took a 10% reduction at that. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevens. Hi. Dunlap? Okay. Dunlap? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to vote yes on this, but I do object to the the still photographer having a six hour minimum mayor when we have Inglewood residents in this oh, yeah, business who would love to have that work. Completely different from who does the council. Madam, Madam City Clerk. Frank, I'm sorry, Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. Item seven. Staff report recommending award of contracts for residential sound installation phase nine group 1J per bid number CB12-08. Move items one through five. Second. Mr. Esparza, welcome. Good evening, David Esparza. Good evening, David Esparza, Assistant City Manager, Chief Financial Officer. Before you, you have <coughs> a contract in the uh, total amount of $1,443,052 to be let to the uh, uh, DAB Construction uh, Incorporated. This total amount uh, uh, includes $1.1 million for the 
agreement with the construction one hundred thirteen thousand dollars and one hundred eighty one hundred thirteen thousand one eighty in uh, ten percent contingency and then also uh, uh, amounts for RSI s salaries and benefits uh, <coughs> for a total amount of the $1.4 million. <clears throat> also, uh, it came late, but it was, in, it was provided, was the addresses of all the uh, units that were being uh, uh, pulled together for this particular contract. And I believe that you have that copy. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Spars, is the information with regard to the units being uh, received in the sound installation, is that something that was out for the public inspection as well? I'm, I'm sorry, what? You just referenced that at the sort of a late notice that uh, you, you had all the addresses of the homes in this particular block of, of area that uh, will be sound insulated. I was just asking if that particular list was out for public inspection on the table. Uh, yes, it should, yeah, the copies were put out on the table. Okay, I just wanted to guarantee that. Yes. Um, actually, my, uh, my uh, comment is really very simple, and that is, uh, a member of the public referenced uh, some stained glass windows that uh, were removed and put in just plain uh, glass with regard to some, a few of the homes. That's completely unacceptable completely unacceptable, um, meaning that the members of the public apparently are not being told their rights. So I'd like you to please make sure uh, your staff communicates the, to them their rights under the law with regard to having their home sound insulated. If they have decorative doors, decorative windows, which would be stained glass, which are beautiful in this city when you drive in some certain areas, are absolutely beautiful, stained glass windows. We are to protect those windows. We are not to remove them. Uh, I believe that they were not informed of their right to keep those windows to receive the sound insulation. So please uh, look into that and make sure it does not happen again because if someone has those beautiful stained glass windows, they need to be able to keep them. And uh, we need to work around it with regard to uh, how we deal with that to provide adequate sound insulation, but yet they keep the their stained glass, whether that's something behind them or, or whatever. But the law does require that if they have decorative doors, decorative windows, that they should be able to maintain that integrity. So would you, if you'd look into that, I would greatly appreciate it. Yes, Because I, uh, I just uh, hate to think about driving around certain of our beautiful uh, neighborhoods and seeing these gorgeous uh, stained glass windows uh, removed. So uh, if you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, that concludes my remarks, Mayor. I'm prepared to support this item. I just wanted to reference that with regard to the public's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Briefly, Mr. Sparza, do you or Ms. Joe have any information as to that issue? Uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Joe is here. Go ahead. In regards to the removal of stained glass windows, we pretty much do not want to remove those windows and we don't uh, we offer a type of remediation that's called a laminate that we put behind mm -hmm. these windows mm -hmm. and so we do keep those windows some of the windows are in very poor condition and the owners are wanting to have those products removed so we don't encourage it okay it's I on my time wait a minute I'm to my time oh, and see the re yeah, you concluded your remarks and see, Ms. Joe, the reason I called you up is because, you know, I know that. And, right. and, and if you come here and you spend 60 hours a week, it's easy for you to find these things out. Mm -hmm. But I don't like to see staff criticized right. unilaterally without even just asking the question, mm -hmm. do we do that? I wouldn't have asked it in public except that we had these statements made. Mm -hmm. Sometimes everything is not as it seems. Sometimes owners want their windows taken out. Sometimes they're not serviceable. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any comment, Council Franklin? No comment. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevens. I have a comment. Ms. Joe. Hi. Just for the record, Mr. Sparse and Ms. Joe, churches are also being sound insulated, correct? Not at this juncture. Not at this junction? That's correct. Churches have been sound insulated, though, haven't they? not in the city of Inglewood. Right now our first priority are the uh, residential structures. 
for the residential structures. Yeah. That's our first priority. Right. So before we'll even get to the churches, we will insulate the residences first. Right. Now, I just want to ask you a question. When it comes to stained glass windows, such as the very decorative picture windows that we have here, especially in the avenues, you know, with the um, crest and the shields, picture windows, those windows, those, the, the um, leaded glass windows, we are removing those, aren't we? Well, again, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of variables involved. So again, dealing and it, per, it really uh, relates to the condition of the window itself. So as I mentioned uh, in my response to Councilwoman Dunlap, <coughs> we do not really prefer to remove those. A lot of times it's the owner's uh, mm -hmm. request to have them removed. But where we can, we do provide the appropriate modification. So we have design teams and firms who are well aware of the fact that um, you know these are aesthetic features and we do want to retain that. Well, I recognize that we have a new director of our RSI department, and that's an excellent new policy. But you know, on 102nd Street, where uh, LAX expansion started, Laxon, some of the very first people to have their homes sound insulated, they had those beautiful pain windows, uh, the 7th Avenue, 6th mm -hmm. Avenue on 102nd Street. And I remember, I remember many of them having their beautiful stained glass windows with the shields and the crest removed and, it's, and, and losing those in exchange. And they had to because in order for the company to sound insulate their home and replace their windows and to bring it down to the noise level, they had to remove those single pane lead, leaded windows from their residences. And so I'm glad to hear that now we have a new policy because a number of people, <laughs> oh man, a lot of people, lost those beautiful lead glass windows. And uh, I've seen that sandwiching of the leaded glass windows. And to tell you the truth, what I saw is not really that, that attractive because after a period of time on the inside of the laminate, and because it's plastic, it has a tendency to streak, and it also has a tendency to cloud. And because it is a laminate, it's not actually glass with the argon gas filled. See, the triple pane windows that we install, they have an argon gas fill inside of it. Mm -hmm. And so it cuts down on the, um, the uh, moisture content in between the glasses. But when we just simply place that plastic sheathing in front of it, it looks good for the first, oh, seven months. But after that, <coughs> it, sort of, it really deteriorates. And I know Los Angeles does it also, but uh, it's not something that I would recommend. So I'll, I'll conclude with that, but Ms. Joe, I'm glad to see that we're on, the, on a new road here, road here, and we're going down a uh, better path than before. And thank you very much. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Dunlap. Aye. Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. DR3 has been pulled, DR1. D did you, I'm sorry, did you say DR3, DR3 was pulled? DR3, 3R3 is pulled. Well, okay, thank DR1. you. DR1. Staff report recommending approval of agreement with Wildem Financial to provide professional services in connection with the district administration and RE engineering services related to the city's assessment district. Move approval. Second. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Dunlap. Aye. Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. DR2. Staff report recommending adoption. Excuse me, of a resolution approving the new memorandum of understanding for employees represented by the Inglewood Police Civilian Management Association. Move approval. Second. Staff report. Uh, Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, it's Michael Falco. I'm the Assistant City Manager. One of the departments I oversee is the Human Resources Department. Uh, the item DR2 before you is a request that the Council uh, adopt the uh, memorandum of understanding that was agreed to between the City of Inglewood and the Inglewood Police Civilian Management Association. That is the uh, management group uh, that is over in the police department. Uh, the reason that it took uh, so long for us to get this item to the council for adoption is that last year when we uh, were able to get the uh, terms and conditions uh, and, and whatnot 
part of the MOU, the actual language agreed to between the city and IPCMA, they asked to review it uh, prior to. So what we actually brought to you in December, I believe it was 19th of last year, was to adopt the last, best, and, and final, which was the terms that we agreed to. You might recall back in 2010, uh, the unit was brand new, and that unit did, uh, did not uh, agree to the language of the previous or successor MOU, which was actually the IMEO. That was the same level of, of staff that transitioned and created their own group. And so as a result, uh, they did not agree to the language, and we brought to the council uh, the agreement to accept the terms and conditions of our last, best, and final at that time, but we had no agreement on the language, and they chose to wait until the next go-round, which of course was this past December. So we uh, finally were able to agree. The language is virtually identical in most cases to the IMEO, or Inglewood Management Employee Organization, and as a result, uh, we brought it forth to the council for adoption so that it could be formally uh, adopted along with all of the other uh, MOUs that the council has adopted uh, already. Able to answer any questions. Madam City Clerk. Council members. Oh, actually, uh, Mayor, I would like uh, Mr. Falco to go over, if you would, even though you're stating that, uh, for the record that some of these are the same, uh, some of the highlights of, of this uh, MOU for just for the public edification with regard to, you know, since we, we talked earlier about the fact that we're on furlough, yes, uh, with regard to the work schedule, uh, potential for getting raises even during these uh, dire times. Uh, uh, I do know that we have other uh, bargaining groups that are getting regular raises, and I'd like you to speak to some of the types of raises that may be available here. I can tell you, uh, uh, Councilwoman, no groups get raises uh, with the exception of those that are required by the MOUs. Uh, in the case of... I'm speaking to the MOU. Uh, in, uh, yes, ma'am, I'm going to answer the question. Well, actually, I want you to, to speak to this. I made the comment that there are built-in pay increases in some of the other MOUs, and I asked you specifically to address this one with regard to what types of raises may be built into this particular agreement. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the agreement with the IPCMA is identical to that of the IMEO, which is to allow for increases automatically only when there is a new uh, hire. Uh, the first two uh, annual performance evaluations, uh, provided the person passes their probationary period, which is traditionally one year but could be extended to 18 months, is an automatic 5% increase. Uh, the second year anniversary or the first anniversary after the completion of probation is another automatic and then everyone after that is merit based and not automatic. Uh, that is how IMEO and IPCMA uh, operate. Uh, SEIU, which uh, is different than these, uh, is an automatic increase of 5% every year until the person reaches the top step. Uh, thank you. Uh Mr. Fields, uh, could you bring back to this council, I know you wouldn't have it at your fingertips right now, with regard to merit increases that have been uh, provided uh, to actually employees of all bargaining groups um, since we've been dealing with our financial crisis, merit increases which have nothing to do with the mandated rate uh, increases as was referenced by Mr. Falco. The 5% uh, after the first year and then the 5% after the second year, I know there have been merit increases that are distributed in Actually, I think uh, across the board, all the different bargaining groups have some degree of uh, potential for a merit increase. So if you could <coughs> go back to this council uh, uh, during, say, the last two fiscal years, maybe even go back one more because we've been having uh, our financial crisis for probably at least in 2010, 2011, through the last counting this year, with regard to the amount of those uh, merit increases which are uh, subjective, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilwoman, if I could ask for a clarification on that. Are you asking for only the ones that are merit-based and not automatic, or all increases? Mr. Falco, merit, M-E-R-I-T, merits. Uh, obviously, the others are, are mandated. And I mentioned uh, subjective. Merit is subjective. 
the, the reason, Councilwoman, that I asked him, I, I do understand the word merit. The difference is that we don't track them differently in our Eden payroll system. So I'm not positive how I would be able to filter out the automatic increases. I could easily say that, for example, uh, almost all of the ones well, in SEIU. Yeah. Uh, you, you have a minute and 30 you, seconds, ma'am. the work, if you would, please, just to determine. I'm sure there's some records I would think that Mr. Field probably has to sign a particular piece of paper for a merit increase. Maybe that would be an easier way of tracking as opposed to looking in the Eden system. Uh, but the public uh, is, is interested in knowing with regard to our financial condition and the amount of merit increases, which are subjective, not the automatic. Those are guaranteed by the MOU across the board. All different bargaining groups have these, uh, these increases, just the merit. So I'm thinking an easier way of researching might be the, the sign-off of the city manager. I believe you have to sign off on all merit increases. So I think that would be a separate database that would, might be easier for us to, to go through. And if that's not possible, if you get back to me on that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. So yes, ma'am. Madam Senator. I have a comment. Councilman Stevens. Mr. Falco? Yes, sir. I, I have to ask you this question. You know, one of the reasons why we were not able to file our grant report timely, so it is believed that it's that because of the Eden system, correct? I don't, I, I, I don't believe that to be the case, no, sir. The Eden system is a comprehensive uh, enterprise resource management tool which has many different components, one of which happens to be payroll, human resources, timekeeping, uh, and it's a host of other accounting. accounting Yes, sir. A host of other accounting in terms of accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, project tracking. Uh, there's agreement tracking. There's there's quite an array of components of that solution. Uh, a, if I understand correctly, the grant reporting issues related to the ability to provide uh, the grantors with appropriate documentation that related to the expenditures and receipt of funds and how they were utilized, that would be something that the hard copy documents and how the documents were potentially entered into the Eden system and then thereby reflected in the various accounts. Um, I don't believe it is a, a failure of the system itself. I believe it well, would no, be it the process itself. It wasn't a failure. Of the, that's my point. It wasn't a failure of the system because we're using the Eden system for this, aren't we? We use, the, we use the Eden system for a, a, a large array of things within the city. So here's my, here's, my, here's, here's my point, is that if we have competent staff that is able to operate the Eden system for this, mm -hmm. which we're dealing with here today, then why weren't we able to have competent staff operate the Eden system when it was dealing with the grant reports that were not filed and where we were not able to account for where the money was spent for three, four years. Why were we, why, what, why did we not, why were we able to train one group of employees with the Eden <coughs> system, but the other group of employees, they just simply couldn't grasp, this, grasp the concept of the Eden system? Why was I, that? I, I don't actually believe it was an issue of the staff's inability to utilize the tool. I believe it was the processes that were in place to require how various components of the process were done. That unit doesn't report directly through me, but I do understand what is necessary from a finance perspective. So if the information is not correctly entered into the system, the system itself is not going to be able to provide the output necessary, but that would not be a failure of the system itself. It would be a failure of the process. If the documentation that was necessary by a granting agency was somehow uh, not entered into the system and you had year over year over year go by, they would then have to go back to the manual uh, paper to try and figure out, uh, for example, how certain monies might have been allocated. And if I understand correctly, uh, I believe that is the issue, not the mm -hmm. issue of yeah, the system itself. Well, I know that. That's the issue is that we did not have the documentation of basically where how the money was spent and that still lingers and the problem is, is is just that but the excuse that was used oh about a year and a half ago the very beginning my tenure here was that well not by you was that the Eden system the employees were not familiar with the Eden system and that the employees somehow were not able to operate the Eden system. And because the employees were not familiar with the Eden system, uh, we fell behind. That wasn't the case. And I just wanted to make that public to the public, is that it's not that our employees were not able to operate or we did not have employees who could, in fact, operate the Eden system. The problem was, was that we could not account for where the money was spent. 
millions of dollars, millions of dollars. Hundreds of people have died waiting for their sound insulation, but nevertheless, that's not the item here at this moment. I just wanted to clarify that. And we're not using the Eden system now, right? Correct? In the RSI? The Eden, yeah, yes, sir, we are. The Eden we system are? is an enterprise tool that's utilized throughout the city by virtually every department uh, for, I mean, I, I could give you a laborious list of all the components, but the so issue we're is still it's utilized. using the Eden system in RSI? We're using the Eden system for the certain processes within the city, of course, because remember, all of the budget creation, all of the accounts, whether they be receivables, payables, vendor histories, construction related, whether they be public works, RSI, parks and recreation, it's all utilized within the same thing. Otherwise, we would have no mechanism for being able to account for all of the various components of your budget. That's why your budget document is 520 some odd pages long, because every one of those uh, segments or sections is account coded, and that's the only way we would be able to go into the system system and determine that information uh, and that is the time okay your time um, mr. Sparza could you come up because now we need to clarify some things <coughs> All right mr. Falco and I'm, I'm gonna need you for yes sir too. <coughs> first of all no one has ever put forward that the problem with the records re reconciliation in RSI was due to the implementation of the Eden system. Is that or is that not correct? You are correct, Mayor. That has never been said. What was stated was we went to a new financial system and there were separate silos of information kept. Records were kept in the RSI department. Some records went to finance by virtue of the need for those records to be paid. And then they had two silos of information. And then we overlaid that with a new accounting system. And that added to process issues that Mr. Falco alluded to. So, Mr. Esparza, in our effort to reconstruct our records, in our effort to, re to qualify to receive the monies that now we have access to, we went through a process, isn't that right, of records reconciliation and process renovation so that we had a good audit trail. Is that correct? Could you just give us a little bit about that? Uh, you're, ab you're absolutely correct. Uh, uh, back in November, December, January, and even into February, we had uh, uh, staff from LAWA working with the uh, RSI staff in order to pull information together. There, and, and actually there was one other silo that uh, existed, and that was the outreach portion of the program. So we actually had three silos, outreach, finance, construction. And although the uh, Eden system was capable of tracking the finances, was, that, was capable of tracking the contracts that were let to various uh, construction firms and other vendors, uh, there wasn't the coordination of the outreach effort, which was you know, essentially letter driven and the accumulation of the respondents to those letters and then you know developing a flow chart through the rsi program so that all of these different uh, data sources if you will were linked together which then could produce the reports that law was was requesting and so what we had is a very fragmented uh, mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. to producing the the invoices and payments producing the outreach efforts, producing the uh, records of construction, but it was the coordination of all of those efforts from the start to the, to the end that was lacking and which is really the focus of, of uh, uh, looking at the system itself, the process, and, and as I had mentioned in my, my previous presentation from last week is that we're the uh, CSDA, who is the having the you know providing us with program management services, is looking at that and possibly, if in fact our system can't be wedded, to bring in a system that will allow that information to be coordinated so that these reports can be produced to the satisfaction of law. Okay. And so one of the things that Mr. Fields did when he brought you on board was he consolidated finance 
and residential sound installation under the same assistant city manager and chief financial officer so that everyone involved in records generation and bill paying would report to the same manager. Isn't that correct? That is very correct. Okay. And so w this took us time to, to get this together to account. In any of our audits with LAWA, any of our own internal audits, have we found evidence of missing money or misappropriation of money? No, we, there's there's been no indication of malfeasance, uh, fraud, uh, you know, in in the uh, uh, absconding of you know of funds. Okay. All right, and and it's just a matter of you know coordinating. And I'll be the first to admit that you know the record keeping wasn't what it should mm -hmm. be, but it was really the lack of coordination between all three silos. Okay, we had terrible management systems, but we have come so far that. Uh, I just came back from a lobbying trip and spoke to the FAA. And two years ago, they already shut our program down when, when we went back, and I told them that we would fix it. And they were so impressed that they have now authorized us an additional $6 million on top of what LAWA has authorized us. And if we're able to spend that successfully, they'll give us another $6 million on top of that. And so what I'm, what I'm really tired of is this rhetoric about what happened in the past and how people have died waiting for sound installation. It's terrible how the program was managed in the past, but there has to come a point when we have to celebrate our successes. I heard someone say, well, you know, don't look through rose-colored glasses. I see the opposite. I see some of us trying to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. We've done a lot of good things, and, and there are going to be probably 2,500 to 3,000 people that are going to get their homes done that wouldn't have done, gotten it done before now. And so I wanted to make that clear. We've done some excellent things. Mr. Fields, I want to congratulate you on how you realigned those uh, functions under one city manager so that now we have a good story to tell. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevens. Actually, the council did that, but I. Done that. Aye. Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. CM1. Thank you, Mr. Sparrow. No city manager reports. A1. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. There was a closed session held as to CS1, closed session, confidential, attorney client privilege, potential litigation under government code section 54956.9B1, County of Los Angeles. Discussions were held, however, no final action was taken. There was a closed session held as to CS2, closed session, confidential, attorney-client privilege, potential litigation under Government Code Section 54956.9B1, Nina Shaw. Discussions were held, directions given, however, no final action was taken. There was a closed session held as to CS3, closed session, confidential, attorney-client privilege, potential litigation under Government Code Section 54956.9, subsection C, United States National Association versus 101 La Brea Plaza LLC. Discussions were held, direction given, however, no final action was taken. There was a closed session held as to CS4. Closed session, confidential attorney client privilege, potential litigation under government code section 54956.9B1, claim of California claims management services. Request a motion to authorize payment of billing. So moved. Second. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Dunlap. Aye. Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. There was a closed session held as to CS5 and CSA1. Closed session, confidential, attorney client privilege, pending litigation under government code section 54956.9, subsection C, ordered by Department of Finance for the remittance of low and moderate income housing fund. Discussions were held, however, no final action. Uh, was taken, what direction was given to staff. And that concludes the reports out of closed session for this evening. CC1, Madam City Clerk. More remarks. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, CT1, Madam City Treasurer. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to give a brief report. I did uh, had two million of the city's bonds that had been previously bought have been called and those bonds was called away. And basically what happens if I buy a bond, say, at 1.15, 1. 1. and should interest rates decline, and I only have, say, six months call protection, those bonds will be called away from me. So these bonds were called away, and then they were reinvested in Fannie Mae at 1.05. Uh, 
and, uh, and that was in, and that was that was invested with Higgins Company. And also, would like to point out that the um, for the bills that was paid for the uh, month of the month of March was 8.8 .8 million dollars. The gross payroll was 3.4 million, and the uh, total for the month was 11.3 uh, million. And for the month of April thus far, the bills that have been paid thus far have been 6.2 million, and the and the uh, net payroll has been 1.3, and the total for the month have been 7.4 7 million dollars. And I would like to point out that interest rates continue to decline. Uh, the LAIF, uh, the local in investment <coughs> agency fund, is is currently at 0.28, so the rates are still quite low. And the uh, that's the daily, and the quarterly is about 0.29 percent. And the bond offerings are very low. Uh, from the one year, there is no offerings at all. And from the two year through the four year, the rates are about 0.27 to about 0.50. And even in the five year range, the, the offerings is at 1 percent. And the higher offering at 1.5 is, is, is a bond that's going to be sold at a premium. That means it's above par. And also, I'd like to point out with regards to uh, banking charges continue to be quite high. It's my understanding that the uh, Finance Department is going to be sending out an, F, an RFP for banking services. We're current with B of A, and thus far we paid 102,000, almost 103,000 dollars for banking services, and we have six months to go. So generally, the banking services have been more than uh, two, two, uh, <coughs> 200,000 dollars for the for the year. And I called the B of A regarding our lockbox services, and we went to the lockbox services uh, about seven years ago, and I mentioned that. For the month of October, for some reason, they always go up one, uh, goes up a thousand dollars, and they were to look into that and then get back to me regarding that. And also with regards to um, bank failures, there has been eight bank failures thus far this year. Three banks with assets of 250 million dollars uh, at a cost of um, 50 million dollars to the FDIC. Uh, they failed over on f on April the 19th. One was in Florida, and the other was was in uh, Kentucky. And thus far, the outstanding debt for the smaller banks that didn't pay their bailout is roughly about 11, 11 billion dollars. And also, I'd like to make just a comment regarding uh, uh, a comment that Council Member uh, Dunlap made last week regarding. She asked me what had happened, uh, what, whether or not the $3.9 .9 million regarding Hollywood Park had been invested. And I'd like to point out, you know, I had major surgery last year, and I was away from the city more than four months. And I was away at this particular time, and of course, Council Member Dunlap knew I was aware, was away at, the, at that time, so I told her I had no knowledge regarding that particular uh, 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 funds that she was re referring to. But basically, you know, had she called my office, because I compiled dozens of reports uh, that's produced by the Eaton system on um, multiple different kinds of, of uh, matters regarding the city. Had she called my office instead of waiting to Tuesday night when we have, you know, the council meetings are, of course, are, are recorded and shown on TV. We have bright lights and action and everything, but Oscars are given away on Tuesday night. But basically, um, that transaction happened basically in uh, February of 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 uh, 012. Roughly 3.9 million dollars was uh, apparently sent to Hollywood Park. Again, I was away from the city, but my my deputies did notify me of that of that transaction. And uh, on December 20th, the money was wired back to the city. So the money was wired to the general fund account. Again, I should just simply call my office. There would be, would be no need for the performance at, on the Diaz uh, on Tuesday's night, and that could have been resolved at that particular time. So basically, the money was wired into the general fund account. But keep in mind, again, I compiled Ten seconds. dozens of reports, you know, from our Eden system, and we're talking about uh, all of the amounts are generating the millions of dollars, and I'm looking at hundreds of figures, and I have not committed any of them to memory. But if any member calls my office, I can generally, uh, you know, give them an answer within about 15 minutes. That concludes my remarks and my report. Thank you, Madam City Treasurer. Councilman Dunlap. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, actually, it was a very polite question I asked of the City Treasurer, and when 
considering the fact that she is investing millions of dollars in different pools, and she was unaware of it, I said uh, very, once again, politely, well, let me uh, then check with the chief financial officer. Uh, possibly I can get that information from him, which, of course, I did follow up, and I did get the information. And uh, it was $22.5 million that we gave uh, of agency funds to Hollywood. And uh, the best thing about that is it uh, requires them to have prevailing wage jobs for the entire $1.2 billion uh, project. So that's good news for our community. The $3.9 million that was returned to us has not yet been spent, which is actually my question. Has the money been spent or is it in a separate fund? It is in a separate fund, according to our chief financial officer, has not yet been utilized. But when certain uh, events take place at Hollywood Park based on their remodel, that money is there for that purpose. So thank you. CI1. Uh, initiative by Mayor James Butts. Junior recommending adoption of a resolution authorizing the use of the city seal on the gravesite marker for former Inglewood Mayor Vincent Junior. Move approval. Second. Um, very briefly, my office received a request from the family of Edward Vincent Junior to be allowed to affix a replica of the city seal to the grave marker of our former mayor. Edward Vincent was mayor of the city of Inglewood from 1983 to 1986, and was the city's first African American mayor. He held various elected offices representing the residents of Inglewood for over 30 years. He served in the United States Army and had a successful career with the LA County Probation Department. Prior to serving as the city's mayor, he held office as a council member for District 4 and as a board member for the In Inglewood Unified School District. Mayor Vincent also represented the interests of Inglewood during his three terms as an assembly member in the California State Assembly and as a state senator during his two terms in the California State Senate. After a lifelong career of public service to the Inglewood community, Edward Vincent Jr. passed away on August 31st of 2012. It would appear that the, this would be an appropriate use of the city's symbol to recognize the civic contributions of the former mayor. As everyone probably knows, that this requires an approval of the council to have this use of the city seal. I would ask that the council approve the resolution attached to this initiative to be signed by myself and the city clerk allowing the family to affix a replica of the city seal uh, above his space in the mausoleum at Ingwood Park Cemetery. That concludes my report. I have a comment. Councilwoman Dunlap. Yes, uh, I'm uh, glad, Mayor, that you put this on the agenda. It's an appropriate use of the city seal. And with regard to Ed Vincent's uh, service to this community, people who've lived here all these years, you know, when Ed was, uh, Mayor, he drove, he knew this city like the back of his hand. He was everywhere. I think most of you know that. He drove up and down the streets. He talked about the street repair, the curbs there were out, trees that needed trimming, right? Those of you who are out there, regardless of other points of view and differences of opinion that may have taken place up here, Ed Vincent knew this city. He loved this city. And I think this is a, a wonderful way to, uh, to honor his memory and uh, those individuals visiting uh, his gravesite uh, can easily recognize uh, the city of Inglewood because it meant a lot to him and he worked uh, very hard to represent this city in his own way. And like I said, uh, you s if you were out in the city, you saw him driving around every day all over this city, looking at everything, checking everything out, making sure everything was working perfectly, and he would call up here and make sure it got fixed. Pothole, broken curb, sidewalk, trees trimmed. He was out there, light, a light is out. He knew about it practically before the neighbors woke up in the morning <coughs> and saw that it was out. Anyway, thank you, Mayor, for bringing this forward. Uh, Madam City Clerk. I'd just like to comment. Councilman Stevens. Yes, Edward Vincent um, was our mayor, and as Ms. Dunlap said, he spent very little time inside City Hall because he was out fixing things in the community. He wasn't sitting up on the ninth floor in his office. He wasn't doing whatever others might feel that we should do here, look out the window. Instead, he was out in the community. And that's what set Ed, Ed different from mostly every mayor that came after him, is that he was actually out there with his GMC dually picking up the sofas, picking up the refrigerators, him and Roger, out there riding the streets, picking those items up off of the street. He didn't wait for um, city services to pick it up. He'd pick it up. I'd just like to say um, he said an ex in that respect, as far as community service, 
I try very hard to pattern myself after old Ed. And as Ms. Dunlap stated, we, did, we differed on a lot of political issues, without a doubt. Man even had me removed from these chambers one time years and years ago. But the bottom line is that he did, he did respect Inglewood. He lived in Inglewood. He drove the streets of Inglewood. And whatever he could do for Inglewood in reference for the residents, he would do. Matter of fact, Ed Vincent was one of the individuals that made it possible for uh, Sportsman's Little League to move to the next level, and that's years ago. And so um, it's just something I just wanted to say in reference to that. And so I'll conclude with that. Thank Ma you. Ma Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Dunlap. Aye. Morales. Aye. Franklin. Aye. Mayor Butts. Aye. Public comments. Any persons who wish to just address the City Council? On any matter connected with city business not elsewhere considered may do so at this time. I would remind all of us of the rules of decorum to address the council as a body, to not single out council members personally. Please, Mr. Burt. Uh, my name is James Burt. I live in Inglewood. I don't think $50 is a bad price for what y'all buying, but I would like to see someone in Inglewood make that money. Exactly now, I, the form over there, 527 uh, region, is multi-million dollar jobs. Very few individuals from Inglewood made that money. Now, due to my trade and background, from a, tool, from a labor to an electrician, I always get a chance to get me a little piece of action. And Mr. Steve, I'm sorry, Councilman Stevens uh, gave me just a little bit information. And um, the mayor said I don't want to work, but he just don't know it. I do want to work. I look at Sarah and Abraham, who owns 100, and Edmund was 90. They had children. Now, God don't be good to everybody, but he do be good to some people. Yeah? I want to get on that farm job, that farm over that job as soon as possible. They got about 75 to 150 million over there working now. But I didn't find out until late. There was no inner city knowledge of that job starting up until lately. And if I hadn't have been told certain things, I still wouldn't have known it. But I seen the cars over there on the parking lot. I said, something is wrong. Oh, let me start my watch so I can get off in three minutes. But uh, I know we got a new dick, we got a new thing going. You got your own clock up there. I know. Why didn't you tell me that you had the clock so your time is starting? But like I said before, I would like to know when we put millions of dollars, of our dollars, not your dollars, our dollars, into a job that we get a piece of the cake. Now, I'm going to just say you a little illustration. I went to Marine Calendar the other day. I picked up me two pies, one I like and one I really like. I got me a blueberry and another one. You know? <laughs> and uh, that's what I'm eating out of my pies. So as long as I'm working, I'm going to buy pie. And I really appreciate y'all letting that job be there. And uh, I really hope that the strongest person can give the form a push so I can go to work Monday for them. I quit one job and go to another. I'm used to that. Ten seconds. Understand? Thank you, Mr. Burt. Now we're going to go to bed. So I can work. Mr. Burt, thank you. Mr. Mayor, Council, my name is Joseph Texera. I'm asking this entire council to remove James Butts as council chairman because I believe he's, an, an eth he's ethically unfit to run these meetings. Two weeks ago, James Butts ridiculed other council members for supposedly complaining about the city clerk's handling of the recent election. Butts said those council members shouldn't complain because when the city clerk removed him from the mayoral ballot in 2010, he never said anything bad about the city clerk. But the city clerk knows that's not true. Last week I pointed out that this is just one more well-documented lie by James Butts and he should be removed as city council chair for repeatedly lying to the public. 
Now, last week I mistakenly said that it was at a July 10th, 2010 council meeting where an angry candidate, James Butts, spent most of his public comment time implying that Yvonne Horton and her staff pulled something crooked by trying to take him off the ballot. However, that actually occurred at the July 20th, 2010 Inglewood City Council meeting. And if you type that phrase into YouTube, you too can watch James Butts attack the city clerk for yourself. Also tonight, I've given some residents DVDs that highlights James Butts' irresponsible, deceptive, and belligerent conduct that night. Now, when I entered my comments last week, the mayor told the audience that I was, quote, entertaining, as if I was exaggerating or make so making something up. So just so that everyone is clear about exactly what happened that night, and just how hypocritical and dishonest the mayor's condemnation of Stevens and Dunlap criticizing the city clerk was. Here's a few facts. First, at that July 20th, 2010 city council meeting ran by Ralph Franklin, the council removed James Butts from the mayoral ballot because of a report by the city clerk that proved that James Butts was ineligible to run for mayor because he was not registered to vote in Inglewood for long enough. That night, James Butts was so out of control, he repeatedly dis disrupted the meeting, refusing to leave this podium for over five minutes. And he had his campaign manager hold up a huge sign, both of, both of which are violation of the meeting rules. During that meeting, James Butts said that a report by the city clerk cast aspersions on his character and credibility. Butts said that the clerk never gave him a chance to address the issue of voter registration, which wasn't true. Butts said that Yvonne Horton didn't tell him the truth about the matter, that what she's told him wasn't, quote, plausible. James Butts said that the city clerk's statements indicated to him, to quote Butts himself, that the facts were being misrepresented to obtain a desired outcome, or lying. And Butts said that the clerk was involved in an investigation, quote, where the facts were obviously being manipulated, unquote. So James Butts lied to the public two weeks, weeks ago. He publicly implied that the clerk and her staff did something crooked with an election or otherwise inappropriate. And Butts did this at a council meeting on TV on the Internet. Ten seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council Howard Ely, Second District. Uh, I've enjoyed our meeting tonight. I've enjoyed the comments from the uh, people in the. Uh, and one of the things, you know, you know, I'm impressed is that we have a representative government here. You know, uh, when the people in the Fourth District vote for Mr. Franklin, they don't vote for him so he'll agree with Mr. Morales or Ms. Dunlap or the mayor. And so what, what, what comes to me is why is it that when we have dissent, as we do in all our legislative bodies, that uh, we're, we're going backwards. You know, I heard uh, three or four votes tonight, everybody voted the same. But when someone votes against the three people, then it's going backwards. You know, I think it's, it's, it's very important that we understand that we learn when we disagree. You know, I want to commend um, Mike Stevens for being the one who instituted or instigated the, the soundproof. I've been coming to these meetings 10 since 2003, and nothing happened until Mike came here, and I'm glad that the mayor, with his influence, has been able to go to Lawa. I'm glad. But is the mayor going there or is the council going there? I mean, does the, I mean, you know, when the mayor says, I did it, is that the council or is that the mayor? We, the citizens, are going to benefit from it. But my question is, because we're a council, is one council member more important than the other council members? You know, one of the things I'm concerned about, I heard a gentleman talk about going forward in Inglewood. One of the things I'm concerned about, I do not want to live in a police state in the, state of in, in the city of Inglewood. What I mean by that is I want us citizens to be able to have our representatives to be able to say what they want to say. Going forward, if there's going to be any layoffs, guess who won't be laid off? The police department. Every other department in this city, if there's a structural deficit, if there's a lack of funds, they will, be the, they will be laid off. But the police department will not be laid off. I refuse. I refuse to live in a police state, and that's what will happen in the future if there's a lack of funds, and I support the police unequivocally. I would hate to live in a city without a police department, but I do not, I refuse to live in a city that's going to be run by the police department. <clears throat> My name is Alfonso Parker, Jr., Vietnam veteran, conscious objector, 6667. Uh, 
I have uh, spoken about uh, veterans, but it's all the homeless of Inglewood since I'm speaking to the City Council of Inglewood. It's widespread what I speak to. Uh, when public infrastructure goes private, the poor lose out. We have been, by Bush and earlier presidents, have put us in a private information intern concentration camp. You cannot get your information. Freedom of Information Act has been neutralized since 1967, approximately June. The only way you can get to it is you have to have a lawyer to take the Information Act to go to court, and they still can't get it. You hear this in the newspapers where they request stuff, they can't get it. I'm not speaking out the side of my mouth. These are issues. Uh, this has been going on since 1941. Uh, I have researched all of this stuff, and it's damn good, like I tell you. Pimple on the ass behind in the haystack, I'm good. Uh, this is a bio of a black woman, Vice Admiral Michelle Howard, Deputy Commander, United States Fleet Port. She is the most highest ranking woman in a black woman. This is recent from the library. I research things wherever I find them. Her greatest asset that got her this job that she displayed, she was a good crisis manager. I used to tell people I was a jack of all trades, master of none, but damn proficient at all of them. And I'm stopped saying uh, jack of all trades. I'm a crisis manager all my life from the time I was born. I just read you about what privacy, when you speak to privacy issues, which was done by these presidents, they don't realize what they're doing because most of them don't know military protocol or had any military service. Most of your leaders haven't. The minute you say privacy, you come up under the Department of Air Force DOD. No president, no commander, no uh, Secretary of Defense, no Secretary of State, not even you. None of us can circumvent the Constitution of the United States to accomplish any goal which is subversive. In other words, to get around, through, or over the Constitution. And that's what we live in. That being said, I've been researching this a long time, like I said. And we speak to uh, organizations and doing in community. Cab people who have contracts. I'm an independent. I'm not a lone wolf. Ten seconds. I have, uh, you let one person speak for you. Give me a few more minutes. No, I'm not going to do that, sir. But we, uh, I have a facility now out of my Time. Your time apartment. is up, sir. Your time is up, sir. You let the other speak. No, actually, 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 of you. Actually, actually, I did not. You I, let told him him speak. I told him his time was up, too. Sir, your time is up. Would you please escort the gentleman? See me outside. I have an address where I can, you can see me, my meetings on Fridays. Come see what's being done to you. Thank you. We need to know from children and yourself and Will and spouses are with children. I'm not the VA, I'm not Governor Page. Leroy Fisher again, the First District. I have several uh, comments and questions to, to you, them. Uh, to begin with, uh, these meetings here uh, are always informative to me. I hear you all say that uh, you could have come to me and asked me informally, and I would have uh, given you the answer. Uh, you know, I've gone to many of you and, and asked you questions. Uh, uh, one thing that's always been in my heart was the YMCA here, and I've asked you them why you couldn't have uh, uh, designated the property uh, for that to happen here, and I get no answers from any of you, uh, or you don't uh, chime in together for that reason. Uh, be that as it may, uh, I think that uh, people ought to be able to hear uh, dialogue uh, about things that they don't know uh, because it uh, makes you that more informed about what is going on in this city. Uh, when uh, here a, a week or two ago, I uh, bought to uh, you them the fact that there was a marijuana store at 9305 uh, Van Ness Boulevard. And uh, I came in here, uh, uh, as Mr. Texera has on occasion, even went to the clerk's office, and they were helpful, very helpful, uh, to ask uh, several questions as to uh, how that uh, 
marijuana store got there, uh, who owned that store uh, when it was publicized as to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to let the community know that it was happening. And uh, I couldn't get any of those answers. So, you know, I'm going to ask you all, and I'm going to charge you to get those answers for me. You know, I couldn't get them. I couldn't get them to the clerk's office even. So I would like to know uh, uh, for the benefit of the community. And more than that, uh, uh, I would, uh, that you then, as individuals, would uh, uh, begin to let the community know that, uh, you know, what you think about it and uh, if you think it's a good place for such uh, a business uh, to be going on. You know, uh, I asked you other questions, too, uh, about uh, business, and you're always talking about uh, money uh, that uh, we're short of. Uh, Hollywood Park, uh, at the corner of uh, Prairie and, and Century, uh, that corner, there's always a bunch of cars being Ten seconds. Uh, transported uh, uh, back and forth. And I was wondering why we don't get uh, some uh, funds from that. There are other uh, businesses in this time. city that I've brought to the uh, attention of uh, people in the city that are running sufficient. illegally, and uh, they can't seem to do anything about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. <coughs> Good afternoon, or evening, I should say, Mr. Mayor, council members, staff. I am Glenda Brass, business owner and longtime resident of Inglewood. I'm here today to discuss an issue that I believe to be an important one in the overall health of our great city. I'm a proud resident of this city. I'm proud of what we have and what we will accomplish. This is our meeting. It shouldn't feel like only certain people can have a say in our meeting. It shouldn't be that a small group of people and a few council members can dictate the quality of our meetings. That other residents feel like they don't have a say, they don't have a place, that they don't matter, that they are not welcome. I've had occasion to talk to some of my neighbors about coming out and supporting our meetings. They use words like ridicule, negativity, fear, unprofessionalism, ignorance, circus, and a plain waste of good time. These are where words that should not be associated with our meetings. I've attended quite a few meetings over the past several years and have left each one of them with the same feeling and I could probably use similar <coughs> words. But the last meeting I attended a few weeks ago really took the cake. I actually felt physically threatened. When I sat down after speaking, I heard all kinds of comments behind me like plant, traitor, mayor's pet, and even one of our council members felt the need to rebut my opinion, all because I voiced an opinion that just happened not to be the popular opinion. I almost felt as if I had no right to share my opinion because it differed from theirs. That is completely unfair, and it is not the way our meeting should be run. I honestly can't believe that we have come to this. There has to be some neutrality. After all, this is a democracy, I've heard. There has to be a way where we work together, where every opinion matters, no matter how diverse, no matter how unpopular, but everybody's opinion should be heard and respected for the betterment of our great city. We are on the verge of greatness here, and we need every man, woman, and child to be positively engaged. My name is Glenda Brass. I'm a business owner, a longtime resident of Inglewood, and I will not be run away from our meeting. Thank you. My name is Willie A.G. and I live in the beautiful city of Inglewood. And thank God for women like Miss Brass. I endorse every word that she said. 
Absolutely. We live in we live in a great city. We got three great leaders. We got a beautiful staff, and we got the uh, city clerk and the best treasurer in the world. Absolutely. And uh, I'm proud to be a citizen in the city of Inglewood, in the beautiful city of Inglewood. And Miss Brass just really set things right. I support everything she said, and thank you very much. Keep the good work going. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good evening, staff, city council, mayor. I agree with some of the things that uh, Ms. Brass and Mr. Agee said, but I'd like to advise everyone that those who forget the past <laughs> are dangerously subject to repeat it. You think that we come up here every week and admonish the city council? We're trying to tell you how we feel. I think that should uh, count for something. We want a beautiful city to live in. We don't want it to be full of um, adversity, animosity, especially uh, with the people who we sent to the council to represent us. We'd love for it to run smoothly. Now, I've been through quite a few administrations, and that's why I say we cannot forget the past because we are subject to repeat it. And that's the attitude of most people that live in Inglewood because Inglewood was gorgeous. It was wonderful. It was an ideal city to live in when I moved here 50 years ago but it has deteriorated. And administration after administration, it's gone down. We, I, I know you are all good people. You probably want to, you think you're doing the best for us, but listen to us. That's the best way that you can accomplish what we, what we need. Councilman Stevens, um, for whatever we accomplish with LAWA. He instituted it. So it's okay for people to take credit, but he instituted it. It would not have happened had he not. So I hope that the public will not forget. Don't forget your past. Pray for a bright future. And I wish all of you the best, and God bless you. My name is Diane Sombrano, and I'm thrilled that we all want to do the kumbaya, especially when it's the person who said someone should beat me up. <laughs> Isn't that cute? You know, it, it is interesting that everyone who comes up and wants to see everything through rosy colored glasses and does not want to see that which needs repair or fixing are the very people who have people ejected and who threaten. What a concept, isn't it? We've had more people thrown out of these meetings in the last two, three months than in the entire 20 years that I've been coming here because of one person's inability to handle the possibility that they may not be the best thing since sliced bread. What a shame. You see, those of us who come here come with our facts because we bothered to read that. Someone came to this microphone and said, well, on the agenda, this thing only said lease. That's right. But if you read the actual document, that MSG contract was for a lease with an option to purchase. This council voted to sell 14 acres for roughly $7 million. <coughs> That's not a lot of money on prime real estate. Now, at least one council member read that along with us. Thank you, Michael. But that meant that the others said it's okay to sell our city for practically nothing. 
the most important thing for some of the people who come to this meeting is to support the man who thinks he wears a cape and to praise the co concept of a ticking clock. Unfortunately, good things take time. Good results come from hard work. Life isn't just instant oatmeal. And now, I'm sure, someone will remind me my time is almost done. But keep in mind, not everybody was advised the state representative for the school district was going to have a meeting, which was canceled. But isn't it funny that only a few people were made aware? Hi, Milton Brown. Since we were discussing contracts earlier, I'd like to tell a story concerning contracts. Let's assume somebody's hired at $50 an hour on an eight-hour job. Their duty is to buff your wax, wax your wood floors and to totally shampoo your carpets. You know it's going to cost $400. They begin an hour into the job, the buffer breaks, and his waxer breaks. So the contractee comes to you and says, can you give me an advance so I can go finish the job with new equipment? You say, sure, just sign the receipt. So you give him $100, he gets the equipment, he finishes the job. At the end of the job, you give him $300. You're satisfied, he's satisfied. Then two years go by. You run into him. The two of you get into an argument over a Laker game. You then turn and say, I don't like you anymore. By the way, I want the buffer and the waxer that I gave you for that job. Gave me? You advanced me for my own salary. Oh, no, no, the receipt you signed told me that I can not only get the money back anytime I want. In fact, I got four years to get it back. That, my friend, is called contract of adhesion. What is contract of adhesion? When somebody's put into a take it or leave it situation that really isn't bargainable, and you basically advance them their money, and then later claim whatever dividend that they bought with their money. That's an interesting concept. And basically, while not going into detail, I think at least three or four of you know exactly the scenario I'm speaking of. And I would not have basically come up and tell this story now. I would not want to spend Tuesday night in the bright lights on the TV. I would much rather have gotten a phone call from someone that's got, had my number for eight years. Because I don't really believe these things should be discussed in the bright lights on TV when they could have been done one on one on the phone call. But that's the story, and it has me. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, staff. My name is Ted Brass, and I'm a proud resident of the city of Inglewood. Additionally, I'm a long-term business owner over 35 years in this city. And I am very proud of the direction that this city is heading with the administration. I am excited about the direction. Now, I'm a commercial broker, so I do a lot of working with businesses that come into the city. And I must say that in the past, going back some years, it's been difficult for me to lease properties or to sell properties to potential business owners in the city. It has not been user-friendly, uh, words that are used. However, I have seen that direction change. I get an upsurge. I have buildings now that I'm getting inquiries and leasing, and I'm happy about that. Whether it's partnering with private sectors on improving multi-unit buildings or the soundproofing of residents throughout the city. Anything that's done with improving housing stock, the quality, our homes are, and properties are predominantly older properties. So certainly those things that we can do as a city 
and as private parties working together, I applaud that. I'm very optimistic with this new direction. And I see it's catching on with my fellow citizens and the staff and some council members here. I now say I live in beautiful and work in beautiful downtown Inglewood. I've said that for some time, but I say it with a little more sincerity now as I find that the direction as a real estate professional with an extensive background in developing and certainly selling, marketing, leasing, bringing money and businesses in. 10 seconds. Mr. Mayor, Council, I applaud you and thanks for this new direction. Thank you, Mr. Burks. Uh, Gil Matthew, uh, District 4. I am what you would call a dinosaur of Inglewood. And I must tell you this, nothing's changed as far as council meeting. I don't know what people are so upset about. Nothing's changed. And I've been here before all of this was built. We had a little two-story city hall. But guess what? We were debt free. Debt free. What came in is what you spent. Debt free. I had a fella, my mentor was Fred Jones. Now who in the hell ever heard of a Canadian named Fred Jones? Except some old timers. And uh, Eddie was a friend of mine. Very good friend. Now, if you saw the tapes, and we do have tapes, Mr. Mayor, the eight tracks, but you know, you're a pretty young fella, so. But they do have tapes, and I think it would be helpful to review those tapes and see how the council meeting was conducted. Residents, come to these meetings for yourself. What has happened in Inglewood, you have the Democratic Party we have the Democratic Party members on this council, including Ms. Brown, and including a lot of them, has endorsed against their colleagues. That, this, is, this is unprecedented. I've never heard of that before. But I tell you what, I am going to change my party affiliation. I'm not going to be taken for granted. And we, the people, are going to speak up. Now, Mr. Brass, businessman, we are leaning forward. But yet, Mr. Mayor, you won't tell the truth. You have a resident talking about the budget's balance. There's never been a balanced budget in the city of Inglewood. Never except when the two little story city hall was there. It's never been balanced. But you go and you have these individuals, that's the problem, come here. Well, the mayor, he, he balanced budget. He's doing fine, he's doing wonders. Mr. Mayor, stay out of city hall. Come to the community. Don't micromanage here, you're in the way. Leave staff alone. Time. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. They're qualified, Mr. not Matthew, you. Mr. Matthew, thank you. Woo, two for two. <laughs> Independent thinking. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council. Ray Davis, 2nd District, registered independent my entire voting life. Quickly, swap meet this past Saturday. Kudos to Angela. She did a great job on that. Way to go, classmate. Um, and 
Speaking of the swap meet, unless it's just not doable, we should make that a monthly occurrence. You can, it's a, I don't know how much revenue we can generate, but um, you sell them out every month. And personally, uh, I was the rookie out there. Uh, I roasted. But you had folks that came out there. It's obvious. This is what they do for a hustle on the side. I don't know. But they had, they set up, in, what took me an hour, they set up in 10 minutes. It's like tents, everything, Woo! <laughs> ready to go. And it's happening in other cities. I mean, it's, it won't be the rhodium, but if the city could generate a little extra jingle and it's not costing us a lot, why not? Just an opinion. Um, second thing. Um, I'm a student of history. I consider myself an amateur Egyptologist. Um, so the grave marker thing, that's great. But you know what? Much as I love that ancient culture, they had a few bad habits. The ones that, the one that I hated the worst, and I hate it, they, hide, they hid things. They would hid, they, sorry, they hid their failures. We wouldn't have known about a lot of Egyptian history unless we found physical evidence because they never wrote it down, like the Hyksos when Egypt was invaded and they were kicked out and a bunch of other people came in and took over. That leads up to this point. How many other Inglewood mayors are in Inglewood Park Cemetery? They should all have markers. They're our history. It has nothing to do with political correctness or that, hey, somebody wouldn't care. No. It's history. But we should not forget it. We should always learn from it. Or as the lady said earlier, we'll repeat it. Um, business growth. Uh, Mr. Bass, I totally support uh, your enthusiasm because we have to have business growth here. When the form kicks in, if they're just bouncing from the form to the freeway, we will Ten whistling seconds. Dixie again. So I hope that we will have something. Uh, time's passing quickly. Um, maybe you can give us a quick update um, on when they're time. scheduled to be finished. Thank you. And I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, um, Mr. Mayor, City Council. My name is Larry Springs, longtime resident here in the city, first district and also a business owner in the second district. And I'm a proud resident and business owner here in the city. I love the city of Inglewood. I've been here since 73 when I came out of the military and I made this my home. And I love the city. I see the direction that the city is going in. I saw where the city was in 73. And yes, we have changed. But life is a change. We're going to change. Nothing will ever stay the same, but now we're at a point where we can become a better city with our leadership, with our, our mayor and our city council and our staff. We can become a better city. And that's what we're looking for. My biggest dilemma here is that we're always criticizing the leadership instead of taking off our, our putting on our gloves and getting in getting in there and helping our city, we want to criticize them and put them down and talk, talk negative towards them. But I refuse to let that happen. I refuse to let that happen, not only for myself and my family and for our business, it's not going to happen. This city is going to grow. This city is going to become a model city in the South Bay. This is what we want. This is why we voted for the city council members and our mayor. That's why we voted for them, because we want to see the new direction that this particular council is going to put us in. So I'm in support of our city, our mayor and our city council. I want them to do what they were hired to do. And I need the citizens of Inglewood to support them in what needs to be done. Now, if there's a, if there's a, a problem, let us, the, the city, Council members come out and have a town hall meeting to discuss the things that are they're, disapprove, they're disapproving. Let them have that town hall meeting. The mayor had a town hall meeting, and he discussed the things about where he wants the city to go. 
We need to know, were you there to support the mayor? Were the city council members there to support the mayor? That's the question. Were they there to support the mayor in the direction that he wants to lead the city? I was there, and some of the members that, I, that are here in the audience were there as well. So I'm here to support the mayor. I'm here to support the city council members. I do have to take my hat off to Mike Stevens and some of the things that he had done. 10 seconds. In regards to the soundproofing, excellent job, excellent job. But now we need to move forward. We can't talk about what happened in the past. We need to move forward. Time. I love city and I approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll close uh, public comment. Um, um, Mrs. Kadarian. Yes, my name is Ann Iskandarian, resident of Inglewood for 52 years and two years before that as well, 54 years. Uh, last week something was said by you, Mayor Butts, that I did not approve of. All right, we were talking about Ms. Dunlap and the election and you said something to the effect that she lost the election and Thank you. Thank you. Never mentioned Ms. Dunlap, ma'am. Well, I did. And there was something said that, to the effect that because she was my girlfriend. No, ma'am. Uh, I think my husband will also testify to that. Now, I didn't look at last week's, week's okay. meeting, but I will. Well, no, ma'am, I didn't say that. Okay, there was a comment made about a girlfriend. I would just like to state that for the past 20 years, Ms. Dunlap has been our councilwoman. I do not associate with Ms. Dunlap except for business matters, okay? I think she's a fine councilwoman. She's been slandered through and through by this side of the council and staff, and I'm tired of it. Yes, we could have a fine city, but let our councilwoman and Mike Stevens, Council District 1, speak their piece and quit shutting people up when they want to say something. Even last week, you threw someone out who had something to say that was very important. Now, as far as Mr. Texera, the statements he made are true. I have seen the videotapes. And what you've done is on there. And if everybody else wants to see those, they're public matter at the library. You can just go get them. Uh, you can't hide those facts. So I just want to say, we have a great councilwoman, and we'd like to keep her. Close public comment. Councilman Stevens. I think Mr. S. Kandirian wanted to speak. Mr. Kandirian, did you want to speak? I'm too late. You're not too late, sir. I, I just wish you'd come up with Mrs. S. Kandirian. Dennis Kandirian, District 2. <clears throat> I have been a resident of District 2 for 54 years. And for the last 20 years, Ms. Dunlap has been our councilwoman. This was no accident. She kept getting reelected because she was doing a good job, and so the residents voted her for her over and over again. In my opinion, the mayor or any other council member or other city officials slash employees should try to persuade voters one way or the other. That's the business of each, the voters in each district. Thank you. Thank you. A close public comment. Um, Councilman Stevens. Yes, I'd just like to say I would be remiss to not to um, have the public think that it was just me. It was the people. The people were the ones that propelled this city forced this city 
to change his policy from, sound, from uh, land acquisition <coughs> to residential sound insulation. The city had received $101 million, $101 million, and had only sound insulated 38 homes, 38 test homes. And it remained that way for 10 years, and there's a staff report to prove that fact. But here's, here's the issue, is that regardless of how well staff presents it and we present it in a manner to where it doesn't sound like it's as bad as what it is, the bottom line is that not that the contractors received the money, but the city received the money. There was an engineering component. There was a construction component. The engineering component was spent amongst engineers for sound design. The construction component never made it to the contractors, and that's what vaporized. And what I would like for our body to do is I've asked, since I've come on board, a forensic audit, a forensic audit, because see, people, someone has to be held accountable. The money went somewhere. If it went into the general fund, it went into the general fund. But from there, where did it go? That's the issue. It's accountability. But it was the people, not Mike Stevens, the people that stood with Mike Stevens that made it possible for residents to receive their sound insulation. Now, I just want to say this. There's a few moments left. I have no issue with anyone who comes to that podium. And as Mr. Matthew stated, it's been this way for years and years and years. And he goes back to the 60s. And as I stated earlier, proof is in the city clerk's office in the minutes. But I do hope that the residents, the taxpayers, the people who have the regular homes, they come to this microphone and they voice their opinion. They voice, voice their opinion. I do not feel that because you, have, because you wish to keep a commission post, you go to the podium. Because you want to get a contract with the city, you go to the podium. But there are many people in this audience who have come here for years who are not looking for anything from this city. They come because they love this city. Ten seconds. And they've come here for years and years and years. And new people are coming. And so I'd just like to say that to everyone. I hope everyone drives home safely. But the way things are today Time. is the way it's always been in Inglewood. And it's a great thing because it's democracy, it's community in action. Thank you. Thank you very much and good night. Councilman Dunlap. Uh, yes, um, actually I want to respond to the major topic of the evening having to do with rules of decorum. Actually it's the chair of the meeting who sets the tone. It's the chair who sets the tone. And um, we have a chair now who interrupts people at the podium constantly. That, that's contrary to our rules of decorum. Interrupts members of this body contrary to the rules of decorum. Uh, and it says he, his role as chair is to protect the deliberative process, which is absolutely contrary to what he does. He interrupts and uh, stops the deliberative process on a regular basis. Uh, it, it appears that the time limits are more important than what's being discussed and the facts being presented to the public. Uh, it also states very clearly that any member up here who's speaking should confine himself or herself to the question under debate, avoiding personal attacks and indecorous language. Well, that's thrown out the window. Personal attacks are made on a regular basis by at least three members of this body. Uh, for whatever reason, the intent of the discussion seems to now center around putting down other people's remarks, putting down their comments, and attempting to just ridicule and demean them, knowing that they cannot come back and respond. Uh, even our parliamentary procedure states clearly that a member must confine their remarks to the question, avoiding personalities. If we would do that, then those of you who are out, who are out there who would like the meetings to run more smoothly, be more businesslike, that is exactly what would occur. They would be businesslike. They would be businesslike. So I would uh, plead to the chair to follow parliamentary procedure, follow our rules of decorum, don't interrupt the public, don't counter. You oftentimes tell the people that they're wrong. Once again, they have a right to say what they want to say, right, wrong, or indifferent. They can say it. We, we are not to comment on what they're saying out there. And uh, you, uh, you talk about being respectful of the speaker's mayor. You've actually told one member of the public who is 
criticizing you, which is permitted under the law. In fact, the law demands that the public have a right to criticize members of a body. You call them un-American at a meeting for exercising their rights under the law. So once again, I would ask that we stick to the merits. I should be able to say what I want to say. Councilman Stevens, speak, ask his questions. Each of us, ask our questions, speak to the item without having other people come behind, not for the purpose of putting forth their point of view, but purely for the purpose of ridiculing and demeaning a colleague in this legislative body, and that's pretty outrageous conduct. So why don't we try to really work together? Why don't we just try next week, one Ten meeting. Seconds. Let's see if we can go from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock and just stick to the merits of the issues without any attempt to demean someone else's comments or to ridicule someone else's comments. Let's just stick Time. to presenting your own points of view, how refreshing uh, that would be. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilman Morrell. Thank you. I, for one, would love to believe that that was possible. Um, the, there was an inference that, that clarifications mm -hmm. on certain questions are, are insulting as comments. And the truth is that, uh, you know, when, when you're prepared to uh, make a motion, vote on a particular item, you've more than likely gone through it. Every question you've asked the city manager, if you have one. And, you know, if somebody comes up and characterizes a particular item as either wrong or uh, just quite frankly uh, as, as the wrong thing to do, then uh, if you plan to vote it through, you know, your role is to clarify what those questions are. You can't just leave a question in the air because the public does not have the ability uh, that we do on a weekly and daily basis to ask staff and get those clarifications. Those are questions that we would leave in, in limbo and that would not be fair to the community. It wouldn't be fair to our meeting here. So that will continue. Uh, that being said, you know, the democratic process is a great process. We see it every election season here. This is nothing different. I expect it to get even further down, closer to the election. You know, folks should be allowed to come up here and say whatever they want to say, uh, whether they agree with us or disagree with us, and uh, not feel uh, bullied, quite frankly. You know, we, you know, we are here to listen. Uh, it's okay, we don't always agree. But that's what this platform is for, and more than likely our, our democratic process. Now, the mayor alluded to earlier a, a lobbying trip to Washington. I was present as well as uh, Councilman Franklin. I know he'll talk about that. Uh, we were there. It was excellent in terms of progress. I will say that in the past 10 years, I think it was literally the most productive. It was the most tiring. We had meetings for two full days. I'll talk about some that I attended, the Department of Transportation and the Tiger Grants in regard to Century Boulevard. I mean, not only uh, did we get guidance, but we sat with the right people. Uh, they were very happy to hear the progress that is being made in the city uh, and is basically going to give us as much advice as we can to be at the top of the possibility list for these Tiger <laughs> Grants for Century Boulevard. Uh, I, I can't uh, say enough. Uh, how much uh, they are willing to help the city of Inglewood just based on the progress we've made. The COPS grant uh, extension, uh, three years ago, uh, we made the request that Ten instead of using the money for hiring officers, uh, we would be able to extend those, those uh, grants, and that's something that's going to come up. <coughs> and just uh, briefly, uh, Mayor, the FAA was something we spoke Time. about. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, two years ago, I was at the meeting where they completely were distraught by our program here. And not only did they completely do a 180, uh, but as the mayor alluded to earlier, they committed six million with the possibility of another six million, aside from the uh, 30 some odd million that the mayor worked on in the last couple months. It's been an amazing trip. I have some more, but I'll save it for next week. Thank you very much. Councilman Franklin. Yes, uh, let me uh, pick up with some of the comments made earlier because I've heard that there is a new wave on a breath of fresh air. Um, again, I've been here 10 years, so I look forward to seeing that change on this dais because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And if individuals want to change, it starts with them. 
And so as long as we're willing to work and address the issues and stop this bantering and personal <coughs> attacks, I think it's a great move for the city. I also want to identify that those individuals that believe that they have already contributed to this city, that they know they're doing the right thing, should, should honor what they've done. And if, in fact, you are, in fact, having access to city properties or equipment, then in turn, if you like what you see in the mirror, more power to you. The problem is these taxpayers will not forget. The other thing I want to raise is that I want to thank the uh, uh, Baptist Pastors and Ministers Conference that was here uh, earlier uh, this week. Uh, they had the, the topic matter, the word is great. And in fact, um, it all talked about faith and faith is now, faith is present. And along that same line, we moved to uh, Washington, D.C. And of the meetings that I attended, I want to first of all, identify collectively, they clearly identify there's no earmarks around anymore, that you will fight for these grants and you will fill out those applications. But more importantly, because they saw the new era, someone said, or the new movement of the city, that they are willing to help us in order to make sure that we have the necessary information to include in our applications so we actually will be qualified uh, candidates and hopefully be ultimate recipients. Uh, I think specifically I went to the Bureau of uh, Reclamation where we dealt specifically on water rights and recycling of water and I was taken back to see here the uh, Bureau of Reclamation was not even aware that some of the water suppliers flush out their fire hydrants uh, out in the streets and make no effort to try to recapture that water and that great water can be captured and utilized for, for other purposes. I was also glad to hear when I went to the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development that where we were beating ourselves up, they, they in fact said, you're doing fine. And in fact, they gave us some words of wisdom and direction how we could maintain that. And I, that was a breath of fresh air instead of always getting dog beat. And I, again, I have to say that the, the parties that went all went upbeat. We went with a mission. We went focused. And that was bring dollars back to the city. And the last one I'll share with you that I went to was the um, Office of Energy Efficiency, Renewable Energy. Uh, we're going into new air. Electrical vehicles are, in fact, in the wave. And in fact, if there's seconds. no any, uh, there's no um, uh, uh, charging infrastructure, uh -huh. then it's going to defeat our purpose. And so we're looking at doing some things not only for the city, but also for the public as well. Thank you, Mr. Time. Time. Uh, very quickly, clarification is not demeaning anyone. If um, someone says something that that devalues confidence in our operation is not true. Asking staff to clarify is not disparagement. You know, I, I want to talk about the trip to Washington, but, you know, I want to address something that Mr. Texera has harped on twice. You know, the, the inference that I was a hypocrite. I'm going to tell you something. Um, two years ago, three years ago, I ran for mayor uh, in the general election, and I came in second to Danny Tabor. And uh, I filed my residency change with the clerk's office on time and paid my money. I ran. And I think four and a half months later, I was informed that a complaint had been lodged and that it was discovered that my application had been date stamped. And they had to go by the date that it was entered into the system, which was one day late. And mm -hmm. I thought that was odd, and, uh, and of course, I went to see the clerk, and she explained there was a discrepancy that they thought that they, when they verified, they looked at my uh, application from when I lived in Los Angeles, and I thought that was odd, too, and I wondered why it took so long to come to light, but you know what? Ms. Horton was a gentlewoman to me. She had an elections attorney, and he felt the solution was, well, have him sign an affidavit. Uh, I had attorneys I consulted with as well, and their advice was this. Why, if you paid your money, if you know you filed on time, if they accepted you, why would you be the one to sign an affidavit to remember something that happened five months ago? And they said that the people you ran against, then the next issue is going to be dissecting your affidavit, and you will never get back on the ballot. He said, your other option is to sue. And he said, do you want to sue, have the election go on, and spend your money on suing, or do you want to run for mayor? 
and that was sound advice. And one of the things I said to Ms. Um, Horton was, when she asked me again about the affidavit, I said, my attorney feels no good can come of this. And I chose to speak my piece before the council. I came before the council, and nothing could be more important than kicking someone who was going to be in a runoff for an election than letting them speak. I was held to three minutes, and my uh, manager was held to three minutes. And I was very upset. And Ms. Horton was upset because I know her to be a fine woman. And one of the things when I stood up, I, I, said, I said, Yvonne, I don't know what I said, but I was letting her know that I didn't mean to disparage her. I was upset. Ten but I will tell you this, when the council voted and some of the people that running, ran against me voted to not allow me to continue, what did I do? Did I sue anybody? No. I went back out I'm and I campaigned. So, yes, um, I did have an issue, but Ms. Horton, did you feel I ever called you a liar? What was that, Mr. Falco? Ms. Horton, did I ever call you a liar? All right. So, that's, so I'm not a hypocrite. Uh, Mr. So Mayor, anyway, Mr. Point of you, Order, thank Point you, of Order, Mr. Thank Falco. You, thank you very much. Mr. Falco, much. what was that? Thank you very much, and uh, we're adjourned. Oh, yeah.